childhood. Plus, on the way in our My Pet Tale, our friend Judy Greer tells us about her great love for her dog. And then later, we're diving into some beloved shows, Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Gilmore Girls, so fans get ready. All of that is just ahead, but first, let's see what we have up on Popstar Plus. Amber Ruffin joined us for our What I Watch series, the comedian and actor who hosts her own talk show, The Amber Ruffin Show, it's very funny, was kind enough to tell us all about the long list of shows that she cannot stop watching. What I watch when I can't fall asleep is not a good question for me. I can always fall asleep. TV cannot help me. I'm great at sleeping. If America was in the Olympics for sleeping, I would represent our country and I would bring home the gold. I'm good at sleeping. What I watch when it's late at night. I like to watch every late night show. Every late night show there's ever been, I love to watch it. I love to watch the old late night shows, I love to watch it now. Only because when I was watching it, I never thought I would have a late night show. But when you have one, you watch it, it's different. That was great! You know what else is great? Finally making this show for you all! When I was preparing for this season of The Amber Ruffin Show, I watched, um, you know, I watched some Carol Burnett. I did, I watched some Dick Cavett. I watched some of those old, like, variety show, variety shows. And it was very clear how little you needed. <laughs> There's just people goofing around. And I was like, oh, you know, what a relief. Like those cool things we remember. We're just people goofing around. And that's a torch I'm willing to carry to this day. <laughs> What do I watch? I like to, when it's late, I do like to catch up. So when I'm catching up, I'm catching up on my favorite shows. And my favorite shows are Queens. I watched every last episode in real time. And I can't just be allotting time from eight to nine at night. I still have work to do. And then Abbott Elementary. Hey, yo. What it do, baby boobs? What y'all think about this little film crew I brought in here? Distracting, makes our jobs harder. But exciting, we about to be on TV. Because they are covering underfunded, poorly managed public schools in America. No press is bad press, Barb. Look at Mel Gibson, still thriving. <laughs> Abbott Elementary is great. It is just very character driven. But I do think that Abbott Elementary found some very fun characters and leaned into them. And even though they're big characters, you haven't seen them before. You know, they found a new take on, you know, the bully and a new take on the nerd. Like, it's all so fresh. It's great. And Quinta is the best. What I watch when I need comfort food is the same thing everyone watches when they need comfort food. And that's Ted Lasso. It's the most comforting show on planet Earth. It's just as good as everybody says. But the people who love Ted Lasso might not know that they also love Joe Para's show, Joe Para Talks With You. It is this very gentle comedian and he just is living in i think wisconsin and you know being his gentle self and you know whittling wood and stuff and along those same lines john wilson how to with john wilson is also a very comforting show where you know not a lot happens but it stays interesting and then afterwards you feel a little happier those are the three shows. What I watch that might surprise people is, it shouldn't, but it always does, is Grey's Anatomy. Man, I've been watching Grey's Anatomy since the very beginning. It probably started, I don't know, at this point, 12, 18 years ago. It's a million years old. What I watch that reminds me of my childhood, I don't have an answer to this question, but what I don't watch that reminds me of my childhood is Pen15. Pen15 is that show about those two very nerdy nerds going through high school or junior high, but it was so exactly what it was like to be made fun of in school that it was, and I was made fun of like no one's business, that it, I just couldn't watch it. There were these boys in our grade who were not kind to... Look, I need you to beat them up, yeah. Gigi. Like, it just needs to happen. Why should I? See, like, I told you he wouldn't care. This is literally, like, the worst day of my life, and he'll probably call me you just, too. I, I tried. <laughs> I tried, and it was hilarious, but it just felt... It, it was too soon. 
<laughs> it's too soon. It's too terrible. Too accurate a depiction. Could not watch it. Never will. Great show. I'll never see it. What I watch that I'm obsessed with right now. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. That was so good. I mean, also, I remember each one of those moments. But it was great. And then I kept forgetting that it was Jessica Chastain. She did such a good job. And Andrew Garfield, I was like, how are they doing this? It was a great movie. The Eyes of Tammy Faye. When I want to laugh, I guess I watch Saturday Night Live. I'm a huge Saturday Night Live guy. Times a million, I love it. I've always loved it. And I'm not one of those freaking turds who's like, it used to be like SNL is good today. It was good yesterday. It was good when I was eight. It'll be good in eight more years. It'll always be good. SNL is always good. Oh, I love Amber. So interesting, too, to hear about the late night shows that Amber loved before landing her own. All right, thanks to uh, Amber for swinging by and hanging with us. We appreciate it. Coming up next, Judy Greer opens up about her dog, Mary, and how Mary's changed her life. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. And welcome back to Popstar Plus. In our My Pet Tale series, we ask folks, of course, about their pets and how the pets that they've had have shaped their lives. Well, Judy Greer has a beloved dog named Mary, and we even learned just how much Mary helps Judy when she feels homesick. My uh, little furry creature, her name is Mary Richards, named after the title Mary Tyler Moore's character from the Mary Tyler Moore Show. I'm too young to remember it being on television, but um, I watched it, I guess I saw it, you know, probably on like TV land or one of the cable channels in some hotel room when I was on location working and feeling homesick and it made me so happy. I ordered all seasons on DVD and I used to travel with them so that I could watch them on my laptop when I was traveling for work because it was so comforting to me. I also really responded to the Mary Richards character because it was pretty groundbreaking when you think about it. I mean, this was a woman who broke up with her fiance, moved to the big city, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in order to pursue a career in broadcasting, which again, at the time was very unheard of. Well, I had the most uh, incredible male dog. His name was Buckley and I had him for years and he was my love and my roommate and my best friend. And you know, like all animals, unfortunately, he had to go live on the forever farm with his mom and about a year went by after Buckley left us and my vet Dr. Werber who I loved um, called me one day and was like hey I think it's time and I was like it's not time and he said just I work with a rescue they need a foster over Thanksgiving for this little dog would you just foster her and so that's when I picked up Mary and um, she basically curled up in a ball and just like I carried her around in a tote bag for two weeks and then it was the day before the adoption where I was supposed to take her and then all the people come and like I just lost my mind and I I called my husband and I'm like I can't, I can't get rid of her and he's like oh my gosh I'm about to shoot a live show fine we can keep her like please don't bother me at work anymore so my timing was really good but there was really something so special about having this little creature with me 
um, that did like, I think lower my blood pressure a lot. And I, I can't think of an exact moment in time when I knew she was staying with us, but it just felt like, oh, this is a good thing for me. I feel like I shouldn't have to tell people why it's so important to <laughs> adopt instead of shop. I mean, there's just so many animals that need homes. And there's even now so many like breed specific rescues that if you're like, well, I have to have this kind of breed of dog or I need, you know, hypoallergenic or whatever, like you can find that. There's just so many animals that like are needlessly euthanized. I mean, every day that could easily be adopted into homes. And I think that, you know, Fostering is such a great way to see how a pet's gonna work in your family. I mean, you can find such great animals and they're so happy to have a home and to not have to live in those cages. And Mary's like this tiny little cute, like teddy bear sort of fox raccoon looking dog, but she's really scary if she wants to be. So that took some getting used to and a lot of training. And she has chilled out a lot. She's really feeling self-confident. She's really feeling herself these days. Um, I started traveling with her when I go on location to shoot things and I brought her with me to New Orleans to shoot the thing about Pam and she went over everyone on set and in fact Renee Zellweger's character Pam Hupp has a dog and I can't tell you how many of my friends texted me after that first episode aired and they were like is Mary in the thing about Pam? like no there is only room for one actress in this family um but mary was there and she was like running around and she was such a cutie sometimes when she's like a little judgmental and mean i like to think that she's like my alter ego my favorite thing with mary i love i love going on really long walks and mary really loves to go on long walks we've walked seven miles in one day together I mean, she'll just walk and walk and walk. I think she would walk until she would drop. The thing about Mary that's funny, like the thing about Pam, I just realized I said that. But the thing about Mary that's funny is that she plays really hard to get, but she's so tiny and cute that people keep like, they just keep wanting more of her. They keep wanting her. If she lets, if she lets you pet her once, then you just like wanna keep petting her, but like the next day she might be like, I don't really like, I'm not like feeling you today. She really does march to the beat of her own drummer and she's, uh, she's not someone that can be pinned down, you know? Like she might like you one day, but then she might not like you ever again. Every day is a new day with Mary. That's what I always tell people. Mary has made my life better in every single way. I used to get so homesick when I was on location. And now like when I have her with me, it's so much better. She's, she's, gives me a reason to get up in the morning and like on a day off and sometimes I'm like, mm, I miss my husband and I'm homesick. She like, I think genuinely brings a lot of joy to work. Like she runs all around hair and makeup when we're in the trailer and she loves it and everyone brings treats and gives them to her and she just, animals bring a lot of joy and they definitely like calm people down, I think. And so, um, yeah, she's just made my life better in every single way. Um, Minus the dog hair, that, but she's little and it's not that bad. But I do usually have a lint roller with me. Thanks to Judy for sharing her great pet love. Coming up next, Melissa Joan Hart reminisces over Sabrina the Teenage Witch. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Let's go. This is a critical turn point for this fire. 
And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. I appreciate it. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. And welcome back. Melissa Joan Hart was only 20 years old when she landed the role of Sabrina in the Sabrina the Teenage Witch show. And she sat down with us for our flashback series and shared what it was like to work on the 90s sitcom. I guess I would um, describe Sabrina as sort of quintessential teen girl, doesn't want to draw too much attention to herself, but happens to wake up one morning with magical powers and has to deal. Wait. Don't come in here again. From now on, you use the freak's bathroom. I was 20 when I started it, and I actually created it. Um, it was an Archie comic, and my mom found the Archie comic book on a playground, and she sold it to Viacom as a TV movie. And then my mom kept saying to Viacom, this would be a great series. And they were like, okay, uh, we'll see. And she kept saying, no, 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 it'd be a great series. I'm like, all right. And she was like, this would be a great series. And they cut it together. She cut it together into a uh, trailer and gave it to the network. And they were like, oh, this is a great idea for a series. She's like, yes, I know. <laughs> so the series came together that way. So uh, I never had an audition. It was my part created for me by my mother. The best part about playing her, so any actor, you know, we like to be actors because we like to kind of slip into lots of different skins and pretend to be lots of different people. And so having a series on the air for seven years for a lot of actors can be kind of tiresome because you play the same character for so long, you, 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 you want to stretch out a little more, you want to do a little more. But with Sabrina, it was great because I got to be everybody plus Sabrina. I got to be Cyrano. I got to be a trapeze artist. I got to be Cinderella. I got to be Rapunzel. I loved when she would take on some kind of personality or some other, um, you know, wardrobe or I was a snowman. I, I skied on Mars or, you know, so stuff like that. So that made it really exciting and different. And the actor in me loved that part. We'll see how they like it when they don't have somebody to enforce the law. I swear, the first person I run into. Aunt Zelda? Congratulations. You're the new sheriff. With Sabrina, I was definitely acting because I was definitely playing um, against my type. I was never the wallflower. I was always the one doing a dance performance in the middle of the room or, you know, and here's Sabrina who just wants to be like left alone and quiet and don't let anyone see me. And I'm, you know, I'm going to hide over here. And I just, I didn't quite understand that. So for me, it wasn't the most fun, like the things we were talking about before, like the playing the other roles or getting dressed up in fun costumes. That was all really exciting for me, but the actual character herself, I didn't necessarily identify with. Sabrina, you usually have good ideas. What sort of a fundraiser would you suggest? Pancakes! <laughs> My favorite episode when we were filming it, and still to this day, I think, is probably the pancake episode. I think because it was probably my first time doing physical comedy, and I really loved it. I was like diving in trash cans and, tra and just playing like an addict like that, like just being like, I need a pancake, I need a pancake. And like, it was something I could really, for lack of, for, you know, here's a nice pun, but bite my teeth into. Like I could sink my teeth into like that character and the fun that I was having playing like a strung out teenager in a kid's sitcom, you know, it was like, it was really fun to play. Like, I know a lot of people get excited that Britney was on the show or Sync or Backstreet Boys, but I was always thrilled and I requested, as the executive producer, I could do that. Um, people like the Violent Femmes, Blondie, um, Johnny Mathis for a Christmas episode, you know? I mean, who doesn't want to be with Johnny Mathis when he's singing White Christmas? Lonnie Anderson we had the best time with, or Raquel Welch I had such a great time with. And, you know, all the men on set, of course, were like, oh my gosh, Raquel Welch, you know? And I'm like, I'm getting to act with her for a week. And it was really fun. Getting to go from everything, from pop stars to hardcore rock bands to athletes. Uh, Brady Anderson, I had a massive crush on. He was on the show. Um, some of the guys from like uh, Baywatch and, you know, like all these like hot, amazing actors and actresses. And it, it was just such fun because everybody wanted to come play with us. Everybody wanted to be on a magical show. Everybody's kids watched the show and wanted them on it or something. We had a great chemistry. Everyone was there for the right reasons. Everyone was there knowing that this was a great opportunity. Nobody took it for granted. Everyone rode that roller coaster as long as they could, you know, like knowing this is a, we're on a network show in the heyday of television. 
you know, not only making good money, but getting a lot of attention for our work. And that's what every actor dreams of, you know? And so we got to be in everybody's house every Friday night and people all across the world felt like they knew us. It's been decades of hearing, you know, I grew up with you. I heard Daniel Radcliffe say it and I've heard like all these people say I grew up with you and you're like, what? Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the best compliment because it just means that they allowed me in their home and I was there with them. A lot of people, I was there for the hard times. I was there when they're in the hospital. I was there when they were going through depression and felt alone. I was there when they couldn't, you know, I mean, not just me, the whole show, you know, and a lot of the show, a lot of people identify with Sabrina uh, because of bullying or because of um, feeling like an outsider. You know, they might not have magical powers, but they feel like an outsider. And so I think that the show gave so many people hope somewhere to turn to where they didn't feel alone and lonely. And I think that that was, that was like everything, you know? Thanks to Melissa for chatting with us. Last but not least, up next, Gilmore Girls star Kelly Bishop and her love for Emily Gilmore's combative attitude. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, and we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? All right, we're back. Kelly Bishop might be best known for her role on Gilmore Girls as Rory's harsh grandma, Emily, and she was kind enough to reflect on her time on the show with us. How would I describe Emily Gilmore? I used to say Emily Gilmore is a piece of work. She's um, no nonsense. Uh, she's smart. She's uh, conservative. She has values that are very kind of straight-laced. Uh, she's not foolish. She's uh, she's up with current things, but there's a certain uh, value system that she expects people to live by, particularly her daughter. What was my favorite part about Emily? Well, I like the clothes. Uh, they spent a lot of money on my wardrobe. I liked her attitude. I mean, she was so difficult and demanding and uh, hard to please as far as Lorelai was concerned. Uh, and what I really loved about that whole show was Amy Sherman Palladino's writing, because it's some of the best material I've, it's probably the best material I've ever done. And, uh, oh God, amazing. Funny, smart, on top of it, and as everybody knows, really fast. So uh, that was just one of the many favorite things. I love doing that show. Lauren and I, uh, the day we met, it was like, okay, I could do this. And she and I became so close and still are close. She really is like a daughter to me and I really am kind of like a mother to her. We don't spend a lot of time, you know, talking to each other or texting or anything like that, but whenever we get together, it just clicks right in again. There's just a real love and trust and and pleasure. You know, we we have the same sense of humor. Uh, yeah, she's, she's great. I'm, I'm really crazy about Lauren. My all-time favorite episode, actually the one that tickles me the most because it was so different, there was one uh, where uh, Richard, my husband's uh, mother, who was a very difficult woman, uh, had passed away. And uh, 
I found, if I recall correctly, I found a letter that she had written to him the night before our wedding, I think, begging him not to marry me. I know that the timing of this is particularly awkward since you are to be married tomorrow. No way! But your happiness is too important to me, so timing be damned. She wanted Dad to leave you at the altar. She begged him to leave me at the altar. She begged him in writing, and then she saved the carbon. And uh, that sort of sent me off. He wasn't there to support me because he was so grieving for his mother that during that episode I was drinking. There was even one scene where I was smoking a cigarette. I, said, I called it my, the Tennessee Williams episode for me. <sighs> Who was that at the door? It was Jason. Dad needs to sign something. Uh-huh. I mean, she was just out there. She was so un-Emily. Uh, that was great fun. I really had fun doing that one. There were a few episodes that I really liked, but that one was just such a departure. The zingers and the put-downs. Oh, boy. Uh, actually, one of my first ones, one of the reasons I love the pilot script so much, I, I couldn't believe this pilot script when I got it. It was so funny. And I had no idea who any of these people were or, or who the writer was, anything like that. It's when uh, Lorelai comes to see her parents in the pilot script, obviously to ask for money for Rory's education. And uh, I opened the door and I said something to the effect of, is it Christmas? Hi, Mom. Lorelei. My goodness, this is a surprise. Is it Easter already? <laughs> or is it Easter? It was some holiday which was indicative of perfect writing of saying that's how often they saw each other. It was on, on holidays, Christmas, Easter, whatever it was. And then uh, Richard, my husband's character, comes in sometime later after we've done this scene, and he basically does the same thing with a different holiday. Hi, Dad. What is it? Christmas already? Lorelai was taking a business class at the college today and decided to drop in to see us. Favorite moments with Ed Herman. I just loved working with him. We really liked each other so much. I know, I know one of my favorite uh, scenes with him was when we did renew our vows. <laughs> And he, we danced to the song, Bill, and he said, today, I mean, that was your favorite, you know, your favorite song, and today you can call me Bill. Emily would tease me, saying, if only your name was Bill, then this could be our song. <laughs> well, Emily, for tonight, and tonight only, my name is Bill, and this is our song. That was wonderful, you know. Uh, he was such a good actor and very generous very professional, but just a sweet, good man. Why is it still cooking? First of all, it's very intelligent. I mean, if you, the smarter you are, the more you get it. And it's fast, and so you gotta pay attention. You don't have much time to laugh because you gotta catch up with what's going on. Um, it's funny. I mean, it's, it really is a funny show. But what I decided was that there's really an innate sweetness about it which sounds kind of icky, but it's not that. There's a, there's a decency about it. Um, and one of the things that men started, when men started watching it, which they weren't inclined to because it was Gilmore Girls and all that sort of thing, uh, is that if you look at the male characters in that show, there's no nasty guy, there's no jerk, there's no misogynist, uh, there's no violence. They're just trying to make their way in the world like all the rest of us. And so there's, uh, what there is basically is an innate decency about these people. They're good people. There's, some of them are very strange, but they're, they're good. And I heard a wonderful uh, story last year sometime, that very often um, when the troops come back from maneuvers in places like Afghanistan and places that we you know, hear too much about, they very often sit down and watch Gilmore Girls. And I think it's because it's a feel-good place. It's like, this is what America's supposed to be. Great to revisit memories like that. All right, that's gonna do it. Thanks for tuning in to Popstar today. As always, we're so glad you joined us. Come back tomorrow and hang out with us again. Same time, same place. See you then. I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and each week I'm here with the must-have fashion and beauty products at a price you'll like in Style Finder. I'm fashion and beauty expert Makon Jovo, and I'm bringing you industry insiders and those in the know to share all the buzzworthy products sweeping social media and influencer trends. 
And I'm Shop Today Editorial Director, Adriana Brock, and I know shopping trends. I seek out new and notable products so you don't have to in editor's picks. This is Shop All Day, Ready, Set, Summer. Hi, I'm Shop All Day contributor Chassie Post, and we're back today with another episode of Shop All Day. Now today, we're bringing you sunshine and all things summer style, from matching swimsuits for the entire family, including the towel, to all of this season's sandal trends. And don't forget beauty and accessories for the warmer weather. We've got you covered. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to the products on the show today. Or you can even text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. First, let's talk bathing suits. And newsflash, like many of you out there, I love, love, love a matching set. So you can imagine my joy when I discovered these bold and coordinating beach towels from Old Navy with bathing suits to match. Oh my gosh, that would have been enough to make my entire week. But then, as I scroll down the page, I almost lost it. Turns out that there's even more matching to be had. Not only can you match your bathing suit to your towel, you can also match your bathing suit with your entire family. Yes, there are matching bathing suit styles for women, men, boys and girls, and they are really, really adorable. How fun are these prints? Pink flamingos, bold sunflowers. I love the yellow and black and the towels. It's so chic. And the matching trend is really big. And I think this would make such a cute family photo up and also a really cute idea for couples too. Next up, say hello to one of my favorite sporty trends of the season. Ta-da, it's the tennis court. Yes, tennis core slash all things tennis is shaping up to be one of the top trends of the summer. The beauty of the skirt, as you are likely aware, is that it is a skirt short hybrid. So it's a skirt with a built-in biking short underneath, which makes it an excellent option for any outdoor activity. But here's the thing, especially with this black one, we're seeing women wear their skirts not just for sporty endeavors, but pretty much everywhere. From shopping to lunch to lounging around the house. And how cute is this little skirt. This is a really flattering silhouette. It's got a high waist, which is elastic. And check this out. I mean, loving, loving, loving the little pleating. And look at the shorts underneath. It's got two pockets here. And it's also got a little hidden zipper pocket in the waistband. And the brand says it's made out of a really light and breathable poly spandex blend with a little compression. So who doesn't love that, right? And it comes in 20 fun colors. So game, set, and match. This sporty skirt is a real winner. Moving on to one of my favorite accessories for summer, the straw bag. Yes, natural woven bags are one of the hottest accessory trends of the season. And I really, really love this stylish bag from Amazon. It's an affordable take on the trend, and it's made of rattan, which is a palm vine that has been hand-woven in this really beautiful herringbone pattern. Plus, straw is the perfect summer neutral. You really can wear it with anything. And I love how versatile these little bags are. You can take it from the beach to brunch and beyond. It's big enough to carry your essentials, your wallet, sunglasses, computer, towels, you name it. And I love this pom-pom detail. And it even has a removable tassel. So this bag is gonna take you anywhere you need to go this summer in style. And if you were curious about what shoes I'll be wearing all summer, then look no further than these two bestsellers. They're part of a big trend out there called recovery slides, which are sandals originally designed to help you recover after workouts. But they're also part of another less scientific trend called the squishy sandal trend. 
But regardless of what trend you assign them to, the bottom line is they are so comfy that you are never going to want to take them off your feet. I was introduced to this first pair from a brand called Ufos because my 10-year-old niece had them and she let me try them on. And that was it. I have been obsessed ever since. They are absolute comfort. And what makes them so dreamy is the foam technology. It feels like a thick arch supporting foam platform that the brand says absorbs more impact than traditional footwear. And according to the brand, the footbed is designed to reduce stress on knees, ankles, and other joints. And now for another fashion forward and affordable take on the recovery slide, we've also got a version of the squishy recovery sandal from Amazon. And shoppers call these cloud slides and they live up to their name. I have a pair of these and you feel like you are walking on a fluffy cloud. So you can wear these everywhere from the beach to the pool to the gym, running around the house, running around town or you can really just wear them anytime you wanna make your feet happy. And I love all the colors. There's a great selection of both neutrals and brights, but I say go with the brights this summer. So next, let's talk about another slide trend that you are going to want to know about this summer, the braided slide. Yes, this trend might just be one of the biggest of the season, and you're gonna see this braided design detail pretty much everywhere. And these little takes from Nordstrom are an excellent example of the trend. I mean, they've got that great oversized braided strap and it's actually padded, so it really makes a statement. Plus, these slides are no shrinking wallflowers. I love how they look on the foot. They've also got great details like the square toe silhouette, which we're also seeing everywhere. And they come in great neutrals, but I'm also really loving these new neutrals pastel yellow and purple are, in my view, the new neutrals of the summer. And surprisingly, they really do go with so much. So for the price, there is no better option for a wear anywhere on trend slide. And these really look expensive to me. Now, summer means sunshine and a perfect excuse for new sunnies. And I have one word for this pair, chic. And these, I think, are beautiful. Check out the tortoise detail. Tortoise is a really big trend we're seeing out there this summer, as well as the oversized retro look. I've got to tell you, this fabulous oversized shape really does look great on pretty much every face shape. And I think they look really expensive. And my favorite thing about this brand is that every time I wear these, someone asks me if they're by a high-end designer. And I say, no, they're not. You can have them too for under $30. And last but not least, I have been trying to get this set of resin acrylic cocktail rings into an episode for months. In fact, I brought mine from home. I'm wearing one right now. <laughs> and big chunky acrylic or resin rings are a massive trend. And we've seen some very expensive offerings from major designers. So I was thrilled to find this set of five for such an affordable price. And what I think is so fun about a cocktail ring is they're sort of a statement look, right? But they're made out of acrylic or resin and they come in so many fun colors. I'm constantly wearing the clear or the black, but I can't wait to try out the white or the bright green this summer. I think they're gonna be so much fun. So let's run through all the products one more time. We've got the Old Navy beach towel and matching bathing suits, the pleated tennis skirt, the rattan bag with pom-poms, the recovery slides, the Luca Slide Sandal, the Peepers Tokyo Square tortoiseshell sunglasses, and the resin cocktail rings. And just so you know, Today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. That's it for Style Finder. Up next, McCohen Lovu is talking to Florida Maria Rivera, who went from TV reporter to shoe designer. She'll walk us through more of this summer's shoe trends. Stay with us. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now.
It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back after 49 years of Title IX, and we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hi there, welcome back. I'm Makon Jovu and this is Influencer Trends, where I'll be talking to industry insiders and they'll share their favorite products and the must-have items to shop for right now. And don't forget the QR code on the corner of your screen. Use the camera on your smartphone and scan it to shop these products. Summer is finally here and warmer weather brings new styles. And I'm excited because we have TV reporter turned entrepreneur Flor de Maria Rivera, who has her own shoe line. How fun is that to design shoes for a living? I love it. She's here with her favorite trends for this summer. Hi, Flor. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here with you, Mako. <laughs> wow, you're so talented. I mean, that goes Aww. without saying, but your shoes are some of the, no lie, some of the most beautiful shoes I've seen. Like, really? Oh. No, you're going to make me cry before. <laughs> I still get so emotional over my shoes because it's been such a long journey, you know, to get to where I am, but I feel so blessed because so many celebrities have worn it and I'm self-funded and I've switched careers so many times in my life. And I mean, I'm 46, so people oh. told me I was crazy to start the line in my 40s, but I'd never listened to anybody. You're doing it. You look amazing. Oh, the shoes are amazing. I've been in shoe heaven with my own shoes for the past two and a half years. So it just, sometimes it just, it still feels like a dream. Yeah, what a wonderful dream to be in. So let's talk about your pivot. Because I think your story is so interesting. You're a sports anchor, and then you decided to design your own shoe collection. Do you remember the exact moment that you decided you wanted to go down that path? Yeah, I've always wanted to do it, but I just felt like I was never ready. And then one day, I was actually at a lake. I was reading a book. And something in that book told me, this is the moment. And that's when I say, I am finally doing my shoe line. I am never going to be ready. And this is just the time. And that was summer of 2000. 17 and here we are <laughs> and here you are thriving and shining walk me through your inspiration right when you're designing the shoe do you get the idea in your head first or do you just kind of like jot it out as you go along that's an amazing question because there's so many different ways like the first season i actually had a mood board and my first collection was inspired by peru that's where i'm from that's where i was born and those are my roots but then later when the pandemic happened i just found myself not traveling as much and i found myself at home honestly if you walk into my house you'll find a little notebook in every little corner, sometimes I have ideas and I just start sketching away. And lately, I think that's what's happened. I don't even look at the mood board that I have. Inspiration just happened. The other day I was watching a movie 
and I thought of something, and I think, Mako, it's going to be my hottest sandal yet. <laughs> oh, your hottest sandal. I don't know how you can top this because this is a big thing. So the theme of the show is Ready, Set, Summer, and I'm just curious to know, like, what are some of the themes that we can expect to see or some of the trends that we can expect to see in the summer? As far as shoes goes, lace-ups. Lace-ups have been everywhere on the runways. You see one of my favorite styles. It was named after my grandma, Raquel. This is a nude color, and it pretty much goes with everything. And when I'm talking about lace-ups, this one can tie around the ankles, or it can also tie all the way up to your knees. Uh, so that's one choice. But then also I'm talking about lace-ups in the way that it's just a sexy estiletto that just wraps around the ankles. So that's one of the biggest trends uh, this season. Also also, Michael, I know you love it, and it's this bold color right here. Uh -huh. <laughs> The neon. Neons are huge in the summer. I love the neon, but I also <laughs> love these as well. Can you tell me what inspired the collection? That one has a mixture of silk satin, it's got crystals, and it also got pony hair. But then you usually are used to leopard in the brown and black shades, but I love going all out. I love a showstopper shoe, and that one is yellow with black leopard. I mean, I wish you guys could see the detail on this shoe, the straps. I mean, it's just so absolutely beautiful how does it make you feel seeing celebrities wear your shoes because you were telling me earlier that you started you know later on in life in terms of designing shoes what does it make you feel like when you see celebrities rocking your shoes uh, sometimes I honestly still can't believe it and lately I just get so teary-eyed because it's not only about this moment but for me it's always been following my dreams especially my parents moved from Peru left everything behind to give us a better life and I want to honor that and I want to make them proud so for me it takes me back on time and all the sacrifices my parents have to do and also as a Latina as a woman as a minority as a woman of color I hope and, and pray that I can open doors for those that come behind me or those that come alongside with me oh my gosh how inspiring i know your parents your community everyone is so proud of you all right the theme again is ready set summer so let's talk about sunglasses these are so stylish right i love that they come in a bunch of different colorways but they also have important functions can you tell me about them yes so a sporting sunglasses oh my god they look so good on you <laughs> thank you flor thank you sporty sunglasses are one of the hottest trends that we've seen on the runway. The reason why I love this one, do you like this one, Michael? I love the white, first of all. I love the pop of color. They look great on you. And don't they feel great too? Oh my God, they feel so lightweight. And the best thing is that they cost less than $25. So it is amazing. You don't need to spend hundreds of dollars to look good. So this is more of an angular style that it's also a hot trend. But if you notice, this ones are blue with the white. They can also come with different color lenses. So it just depends what you like. And if you're like me, I will rock this with something neon. <laughs> but it's also, if you're a minimalist, you can wear this with more of a neutral outfit and you can let the, the sunglasses stand out. Speaking of accessories doing the talking, let's move on to this necklace. This necklace, Flora, just screams summer to me. How do you style it though? Do you wear it with like neutrals or you do pops of color? This is just beautiful pastel color. So if you want to pick one of these colors, let's say the yellow or the coral, you can pick a dress or a top or anything that has one of those colors and you're set. And what I love about this necklace, it's a Y2K trend that has come back. It's all over our closet and now it's taking on to jewelry. So it's supposed to be a hottest trend for the summer as well. We saw it on the runway. This is a winning, winning necklace. Speaking of winning, uh, and TikTok trends. I've seen gua sha tools all over my social media, but Flora, tell me, what are the benefits of using gua sha? You know, I swear by this little stone, even though when beauty gadgets we have become so popular and some of them can cost hundreds of dollars. Do you gua sha, Michael? You look like I you do. do. I do, I actually do. And I like that it like wakes up my face, especially when I wake up in the morning, right? So I usually do it in the morning. <laughs> I do it, don't forget about the neck. So I love to apply a little bit of oil Right? And then you just start on the neck, move upwards, Michael. Right? I love this round one. And then, like you did it before, I love to go around my jawline after the neck. And I just, when I get to the end, see, I just stay there. I do it at least five times in one section. And then you work your way up. And there's so many videos if you want to learn nowadays. 
And I love like the one that you have, the rose quartz, but don't worry about trying different ones. The stone doesn't really matter. There's a J and there's different ones. This one I just love because it pinks. It looks pretty in the vanity. It's so pretty. Isn't it so, it's so pretty? It's relaxing too. Like as we were trying yes. it, I instantly felt like, oh my God, imagine coming home after a long day, instant relaxation. So Flora, I love that you brought the self tanner. Tell me how it's different from the other ones that are on the market. Yes, that's a saint one. I tried different one, but I think that one has become my favorite because not only it dries fast, but it just gives you the perfect golden tone. It's not too light, it's not too dark, but if you're trying a bronzer, make sure you use a glove because if you get it in your hand, sometimes they turn orange and it can be, yes, Makoposi, you know, you know. <laughs> it can turn, your hand can turn orange and trust me, it can take days to get that, rid of that. But I think that's a perfect one, you know, to just get your natural glow, like you just came back from vacation without having to go, you know, get a, a spray tan that those can be really expensive sometimes, or you don't, you know, you're not at the beach or you, you want to take care of your skin. I think that's always a, a great option. That's such a great point. Well, Flora, we are ready for summer. Thank you for stopping by <laughs> and giving us all these great selections. Have a great summer, okay? Thank you. Now let's run through all the products one more time. The Flor de Maria sandals, the sporty sunglasses, the multicolored necklace, the gua sha tool, and the Centro Pay self-tan bronzing mousse. And just so you know, Flor de Maria once worked for Telemundo, which is part of our parent company, NBC Universal. Up next, Adriana Brock continues to soak in the sun with everything from accessories to keep you cool to solutions for slicing all that summer fruit. Don't go away. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Adriana Brock, and now that summer is finally here, it is time to slip on your sandals and get ready for the pool and beach season. I cannot wait to show you my editor's picks. From accessories to keep you looking and feeling cool in the warmer weather, to hacks for cutting all that delicious summer fruit we love. And remember, see that QR code at the corner of your screen? You can use the camera on your smartphone to scan it for instant access to all the products on the show today. 
or you can text SHOP to the number below to shop all the products we're sharing with you today. So let's get to it. So speaking of cute summer accessories, let's discuss this hat. It is the number one best-selling hat on Amazon and has over 25,000 reviews. So what makes it so great? Not only is this a great looking hat that can go with any summer outfit, according to the brand, it is also basically crush proof because it is designed to fold up and roll up easily so that you can toss it in your purse or your suitcase all summer long. If hats aren't for you, let's talk hair. In the summer, when the heat is on the rise, we all love to throw our hair into a ponytail to keep cool. So this set is going to be an essential for you. It comes in a set of 12 scrunchies for an incredibly affordable price. You get a ton of prints from florals, polka dots, even classic stripes so that you can match all of your summer outfits. And not only do they come in fun prints to match any outfit, but they have a cute scarf detailing attached to them to give your hairstyle a stylish little flair. Moving on to another accessory I'm a personal fan of, if I could only wear one pair of sandals all summer long, it would be the classic Birkenstock sandal. These are the brand's best-selling two-strap Arizona style. The brand says that this version is actually waterproof thanks to this rubber-like texture, which makes them incredibly lightweight. And they're perfect for all of those summer vacations, trips to the pool and the beach, or just a chill weekend in the backyard. Either way, you're still gonna get the support and comfort of a Birkenstock sandal with an adjustable buckle, and you can choose from a ton of different bright colors to jazz up any outfit. And with summer right around the corner, now is the perfect time to check those sunscreen expiration dates. You're gonna wanna stock up on new ones for those sunny days ahead. Today.com actually spoke with a dermatologist who recommends this very product. It also happens to be a favorite among the team. It's the CeraVe SPF 30 facial sunscreen that offers protection and doubles as a moisturizer, so there's no excuse not to use it daily. So we've covered style and your skin. Let's talk about the ultimate outdoor blanket because it is so large. It can fit up to three to five adults and you could use it anywhere from the beach to the park, even camping because according to the brand, it is waterproof and sandproof. It also weighs less than one pound and easily folds right back up into a carrying case that it comes with. And once you fold it up, it's about the size of a tablet, pretty small so you can pop it in your bag for on the go use. Plus, with all these bright colors to choose from, it's gonna be so easy to spot your crew from the beach. And it comes with four little anchors to keep home base in place. Speaking of home base, we found three incredible kitchen tools you're gonna wanna pick up if you're entertaining this summer. First, a handheld slicer that makes prepping some of the toughest fruit a lot easier. I'm talking about watermelons, honeydew and cantaloupe. It has a large round design with these sturdy handles that's gonna do all the heavy slicing for you. And we can't get over how this gadget is big enough for an average size watermelon. The trick is to cut your melon in half before you slice it to make it a little bit easier to slice up. If you're more of a pineapple lover, the stainless steel tool cuts perfect slices and does all the heavy lifting by removing the core for you. All you have to do is cut off the top of the pineapple, push down and twist all the way to the bottom to get those perfect slices. Once the core is pulled out, you can also use your now hollow pineapple for some festive drinks. Lastly, this strawberry slicer really cuts down on prep time, which is a game changer when you're hosting or you have hungry kids to feed. This little gadget is going to save so much time and you keep all your knives in the kitchen drawers. All you have to do is place the fruit inside of the gadget, give it a squeeze, and you're gonna get the perfect slices every time. It's actually designed for strawberries, but you can use it for grapes and other small fruits too. Let's run through the products one more time. The roll-up straw hat, the 12-piece scrunchie set, the Birkenstock Eva sandal, the CeraVe moisturizer with SPF 30, the beach blanket, the watermelon slicer, the pineapple core, and the strawberry slicer. And just so you know, today works with affiliate partners and earns a commission on purchases made through our links at today.com. And that's a wrap on editor's picks and for our show. It's been so much fun showing you all of our summer favorites. Tune in next week for an all new episode of Shop All Day. Thanks for watching.
There are dozens of Chinatowns all across America. With interesting architecture, diverse restaurants, and specialty shops, it's no wonder they're popular with locals and tourists alike. They also provide places for new immigrants and for families to create communities. But with gentrification and all sorts of problems from the pandemic, it's no wonder that all these Chinatowns are rapidly changing. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Okay, so it's no surprise. There's incredible food to be found here in Manhattan's Chinatown, folks lining up all the time. But there used to be Chinatowns in cities and towns, big and small, all across this country. In fact, the longest running family owned Chinese restaurant is in a place you might never think of, Butte, Montana. At the turn of the century, Butte, Montana was a bustling mining town. The invention of electricity leading to a demand for conductors like copper. Mining boomed, the city flourishing. The demand for labor brought thousands of immigrants to Butte. They came from so many different countries, including Italy, Ireland, and China. It was the classic portrait of the American West, with gambling, saloons, even a red light district. By 1914, Butte's Chinatown was thriving with over 60 Chinese-owned businesses. Now we're gonna prepare broccoli beef. My name is Jerry Tam, and I'm the owner of the Pekin Noodle Parlor. The Pekin first opened as a tobacco shop and casino run by Jerry's great uncle, Hum Yao. Two years later, Hum adding a restaurant, and the Pekin Noodle Parlor was born. Well, this building has three different levels. The top level, obviously, is the Pekin Noodle Parlor. And then the second level on the main street used to be a herbal medicine shop. That shop was run by Jerry's great-grandfather, Tam Kuang Yi. And it's crazy to think that, you know, everything came over from China at one time. Like, they didn't make soy sauce in America. The noodles were fried and brought over on ships because they didn't make fresh noodles. So the history of this place really holds true that this is a Chinese restaurant, you know, from Chinese immigrants. I met up with culinary historian Grace Young to learn more about America's earliest Chinatown. Where was the first Chinatown and how did it get started? The first Chinatown is San Francisco. The first Chinese came to California uh, for the gold rush and that was 1848. And uh, they came because America needed cheap labor and so from Gold Rush, they ended up doing farming, mm. manufacturing, and then eventually they worked on the Transcontinental Railroad. And the first Chinatown formed because America wanted cheap labor, but they didn't want the Chinese to live with whites. So they were ostracized from white communities. So t talk to me about that first wave of, of Chinese immigration to the U.S. The Chinese came from southern China, from principally from the area of Canton, and there was tremendous prejudice against mm -hmm. the Chinese. They were lynched, and because the Chinese were willing to work for lower wages, they were seen as the reason why Americans were suffering so much. So the blame mm -hmm. was unfairly placed on the Chinese. In 1882, Congress signed the Chinese Exclusion Act into law. It banned Chinese from migrating to the U.S. It marks the only time in American history that an entire race or ethnic group was banned from immigrating. But the interesting thing about this Exclusion Act was that there was actually exemption for Chinese tourists, students, teachers, and also merchants. A landmark court case in 1915 classified Chinese restaurant owners as merchants. And it gave them a way to circumvent the Exclusion Act of 1882. It was this exemption that allowed Jerry's great uncle to open Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, paving a path for more family members to immigrate to the U.S. and help the business. Jerry's father, Danny Wong, 
arrived in the U.S. in 1947 as a teenager. Ever since he was 14 years old, he's been working at the Peak and Noodle Parlor, and he just started with the simple roles of washing dishes, and then he learned how to cook, and then he slowly just started integrating himself into you know, managing it and working with the waitresses and the staff. Danny taking over the restaurant in the 1950s, spending years turning it into a pillar of the local community. Well, I've been coming here for at least 50 years, and they give me plenty of food. I never walk away hungry. I love coming to work because of all the people I work with. Like, they choose really nice people. And I mean, my father probably employed over 10,000 people at this, you know, throughout his whole entire life. So it's interesting to know that there's nearly five to six generations of people that, you know, have worked here. The menu at Pekin Noodle Parlor hasn't changed much over the years. We do a thing called chop suey. And what chop suey is, is tidbits of leftover uh, vegetables that were kind of mixed together in its own gravy and served on top of chow mein noodles. We've been serving it for over 110 years. Chop suey is in large part why Chinese food became so popular across the United States. Chop suey was the first time America experienced a culinary craze, a food craze. Mm -hmm. And it's starting at the end of the 19th century that there are Americans who are venturing into Chinatown. The way they got them to even experiment with Chinese food was to make a stir fry that was actually quite bland. Mm -hmm. So they used bamboo shoots, water chestnuts, onions, uh, oftentimes there was celery. For many years, Chinatowns were the only places where non-Chinese Americans could sample Asian flavors. Americans were going into Chinatown, some were curious, they wanted to experience curio shops, Chinese operas. With increased tourism, Chinatowns and large cities grew, but it was a different story in Montana. Like many mining towns, Butte lost many of its workers as production slowed in the 1950s. Once the copper ran dry, then the people just started to pick up and just kind of move on, move on and move back to their families and the bigger states. As miners left Butte for new opportunities, its Chinatown disappeared. In the early 1900s, there were seven chop suey restaurants listed in the Butte City Directory. Today, only the Pekin Noodle Parlor remains open. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at eight on NBC News Now. Top story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Jerry Tam runs the Pekin Noodle Parlor in Butte, Montana. People may know this is the oldest Chinese restaurant in America, but below it is so much history. Despite Pekin's historic status, Jerry says he was never pressured by family to join the business. I never learned to cook until I came back, uh, back in around 2009, because like any Asian American, you know, my parents wanted all of their kids to go to college, so we all went to colleges around the nation and to get a better education, to become a lawyer, a doctor, and what have you. But I went into fashion, and what was great about that is I got to see the world because of it. In 2004, 
Jerry even appearing on Bravo's Project Runway. But a few years later, family duty calling him home. And unfortunately, my mom had a stroke, so my dad needed help, you know, taking care of her and taking care of the restaurant. I think it was really hard on my father because they were in a generation where they loved each other every day. And they were just best friends. After Jerry's mom passed, Jerry and his dad began operating Pekin together. He never stopped working, so he was working here all the way until 85, until he couldn't make up the stairs anymore. My father and I spent every day together. I made sure he was, uh, he was healthy all the way till the end, the best of my ability I can do. My, my father passed in November, and it was really, you know, heartbreaking. He didn't want to say goodbye to my sisters or me or this restaurant or the community. He loved View Montana. Jerry now runs Pekin Noodle Parlor with his cousin, Nelson. Together, they're working to preserve a family legacy and keep a piece of Chinese American history alive in an unlikely place. I've been asked the question, what is the future of the Pekin? And the best answer I can give you is, let's just keep it the same. Let's not change anything, because that's what people come here for. They have their parking spots, they have their booths, they have their favorite place to sit at the bar. I don't think they want any change, because this is a place that feels like home. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. While New York City is home to America's largest Chinatown, the honor of the oldest goes to San Francisco. And that's where the Far East Cafe is located. It is one of the last remaining historic Chinese banquet halls. After a two year hiatus, this celebrated venue hosted the 64th annual Miss Chinatown USA pageant, a Lunar New Year tradition. The occasion marking a triumphant milestone for this century-old institution. Bill Lee has owned the Far East Cafe since 1999. His daughter Kathy working by his side as the manager. He brought me into the restaurant to kind of understand the roots of our culture. He wanted me to remember that, you know, Chinatown is about community, is about traditions, is about culture. For many in the community, Chinese banquet halls are more than just venues for special events. I feel that Far East is kind of like a second home for, you know, a lot of our patrons that come in because they feel so comfortable. So much history and so many memories, you know, 
A lot of patrons that have been here, they've told me, they're like, oh, my parents had my red egg ginger party. It's very similar to like a baptism. And that was like 50 something years ago. And that history is everywhere you look at Far East. The ceilings, the, like my dad mentioned, the high ceilings, the moldings, the moldings are all original. And the lanterns were all imported from China uh, in the 1920s. So they're over a hundred plus years old. For the last few decades, there were five giant banquet style restaurants in San Francisco's Chinatown. But with rising rents and gentrification, most have since closed their doors. By early 2020, only two banquet halls remained. The Far East Cafe planned to celebrate its 100 year anniversary with a big celebration. Instead, it's now planning to close its doors. At the start of the pandemic, the restaurant stayed afloat by cooking meals for senior citizens and low income residents in Chinatown. We applied for a PPP loan and we got over $200,000. We also received money from the feed and fuel program. Then our landlord gave us six months of free rent. Beyond COVID, a different type of virus brought more harm to Chinatowns across the country. Anti-Asian hate crimes soaring by nearly 340% in 2021. When this started happening, I felt very, very sad and also very angry because I'm like, why is this happening to Chinatown? Why is it happening to our community? You know, for these people to target elderly people, to push them down, to rob them, don't they realize that they have grandparents too, or they have parents that are that age? And if that happened to their parents, how would they feel? Then People saw the attacks when they watched the news and heard reports, and they got even more scared. They don't want to go out even for special events like the Mid-Autumn Festival. We tried to invite them, but they didn't want to come. We used to be open until 10 o'clock before pandemic. Sometimes we would stay out here until midnight if we had events. Now, we can't, we can't do that. We changed the business hours to close at 7, 7.30, because safety is the most important thing. Business owners across Chinatown still face hostility. George and Cindy Chen opened China Live in 2017. We've been lucky. Uh, we've only had a couple instances where, you know, people scream uh, anti-Asian slurs. And we're concerned about our employees, you know, coming to work and, and being harassed. I, I think that ignorance is uh, very unfortunate. China Live is a massive marketplace with multiple restaurants. It's in a building that once housed a banquet hall like Far East. I remember coming to a wedding here when I was in college, and there were, I think, I think literally 5,000 people in like six restaurants. But unfortunately, you know, real estate was getting very expensive, so it's not very cost effective if you don't have that business. But two years ago, the couple had to lay off 200 workers. However, with the support of partners, George and Cindy were able to pivot their business on a few fronts. We did, you know, the ghost kitchen was selling outside our box. So we have 10 locations in the Bay Area, from San Jose to Berkeley, and, uh, and they can order food from those ghost kitchens. Ghost kitchens prepare restaurant quality food exclusively for delivery or takeout. We sold so many Peking ducks, we didn't know what to do with all the duck fat. So what do you do? You make popcorn with it. So that's why we have a dick fat popcorn. As business picked up, China Live was able to rehire 100 workers. Despite an uncertain future, these restaurants remain hopeful that business will rebound. More police presence, People are more, as a community, standing up for ourselves, making sure that we have like the buzzy system, making sure that we're together and we're, we feel safe, that we're walking together, that we have each other's back. I mean, dining out is an essential part of life, right? I mean, one more fun is to look forward to having dinner with friends you haven't seen at a new place or a old favorite place. But some old favorites just can't be replaced. During the pandemic, many restaurants have shut down. Far East is now the biggest restaurant in Chinatown. 
If Far East closes, there won't be space big enough to host large events for the community. We were overjoyed having that Miss Chinatown USA event here, a press conference, and just being able to reconnect with the community. It warmed my heart. And my dad was just like so overjoyed that people were coming in just to celebrate. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Hallie yeah. Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News now today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts to learn more about the future of Chinese American restaurants I went to visit chef Lucas Sin in New York City this savvy chef is on a mission to save mom and pop shops from closing and putting a spin on the classics. Hey, nice oh, to meet you. To see you. All right, can't wait to yeah, talk come and in, taste. Come in, come in here, come in here. Lucas was born and raised in Hong Kong. Growing up, he had never heard of dishes like General Tso's chicken. What was your first experience with Chinese American food? Yeah. And did you go, what the heck is this? I was here for summer camp, and uh, on Tuesdays, at 10 o'clock or so, right before bedtime, this van would pull up in the front of the school um, and you could pick between sesame chicken, general Tso's chicken, orange chicken with broccoli and fried rice or white rice or whatever it was. The first thought was that this is ridiculously delicious, where has this been my whole life? And the second thought is that what in the world is the difference between orange chicken and general Tso's chicken and sesame chicken? Why is there so much that I don't understand about this if last time I checked I was Chinese? Lucas actually studying cognitive science at Yale, but he always had a passion for cooking. His summers spent training in award-winning restaurants in Hong Kong and Japan. After graduating in 2015, Lucas opened his first restaurant with Yale classmate Yang Zhao. Junzi Kitchen is a fast casual chain that serves modern Chinese fare. But Lucas remained passionate about the Chinese American cuisine he first tasted as a boy. So, so how did Chinese American food, the food that we have become uh, familiar with, how did that develop? How yeah. did that happen? Now, Chinese takeout is interesting, right? Because it's all over the United States. Right? So these folks come in, they yeah. Yeah. apprentice in a restaurant, right. they learn those recipes, and they then go move somewhere on else, right? To open their own exactly. restaurant. Exactly. And then their cousins come from Fujian, and then those recipes are passed on. And there's a remarkable similarity to, to, to these dishes. Despite the popularity of Chinese American food, many family-owned restaurants that once dotted Chinatowns and other urban areas have been closing for years. Opening restaurants is really difficult, and running restaurants is perhaps even more difficult. These moms and dads open these restaurants so that their kids can go to university and become lawyers and doctors and television hosts and whatnot. And now that they're finally able to do that, they don't need to run these restaurants anymore, right? The li suddenly, livelihoods have changed. That's a good thing. Lucas and Young hatched an idea to help smaller businesses in 2019. Nice Day seeks out restaurants facing closure, then works with the owners to remodel the space and update the menus. The pandemic stalled the team's initial plans, 
but the second location in Long Island is slated to open this spring. It's important to me that these new Chinese American takeout restaurants that we're building called Nice Day work with the previous generation of owners because they have a lot of knowledge that mm -hmm. we don't. They know their customers, they know what sells, um, they know how to cook these dishes, they have recipes. You raise an interesting point, Lucas, mm -hmm. in that you talk to these retired mm -hmm. Chinese restaurant owners. I is that part of the, the, the sense of trying to memorialize mm -hmm. what could be lost? Now, preserving recipes is part of it. But the other important part is preserving the way business is done. Chinese takeout restaurants are one of the few restaurants in the world that if they're open from, let's say, 11 to 10, the work hours are 11 to 10. They don't have any prep hours. The same cooks that do the walk stir fries are also prepping during the day. It's ridiculously efficient, and it's got to do with the setup and the way that the kitchens are run. But it's also important to us that we give back to this last generation and that we can make sure that owners who want to retire can retire well and that that legacy can be preserved in a new type of American Chinese takeout restaurant. While Nice Day pays homage to popular Chinese American recipes, Lucas has been celebrated for his innovative fusion dishes. In 2021, he was named one of Food and Wine's best new chefs. We serve a Mapo mac and cheese yeah. here, which yeah. is a variation on that dish. It's fusion-y and it's silly and it's just an attempt to do something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Um, it, it betrays every chef sensibility that I have, but unfortunately it's delicious and it's interesting and it gets people talking. Finally, it's time to eat. Lucas showing me how to make his signature dish. How do we get started? So the mapo mac and cheese, here, the, the mac and the cheese elements are rigorously American. Mm -hmm. These are, This is elbow macaroni right? uh, cooked halfway. And this is Velveeta. Um, but the mapo element is going to be in the form of a mapo sauce, if you will. The last two elements that really sort of take this over the edge is um, Chinese sausage. Oh. It, it can function like bacon and some dried shiitake mushrooms that we've rehydrated. So um, to start off with, we're just going to cut a couple of things. And this tofu we will then put into the deep fryer. Mm -hmm. This concludes the chopping portion of our program. <laughs> Next, garlic and ginger are cooked till fragrant. Then, spicy bean paste and soybean paste are added to start the sauce. Mushroom broth is added, the mixture brought to a boil so the flavors infuse. Can I give that a try? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's here you go. go. So your left hand's on the walk? Yeah. Yes. I can't, I, can't, I can't get any altitude on this thing. Nothing's coming up. And that's why the pros do it, baby. At this point, everything's smelling quite good. Uh -huh. So the macaroni is going to go in, as well as the soup we just made. Once it's boiling and happy, two slices of the best of the best. Velveeta. Velveeta American cheese. Wait for that Velveeta to melt. Uh -huh. You see that that sauce is already beautifully tied together. We like to play this dish in the Chinese takeout box. Oh, wow. Because it's silly. Why, um, why not? <laughs> it's fun. Boom. Some fried tofu puffs as croutons go over the top. That's a little bit of texture and the homage to the original Mapo tofu. These fresh scallions are actually really important because they cut through the heaviness mm -hmm. of the original dish. Wow. There's a little spice, the creaminess, the crunch of the, the tofu. I hope you get, yeah, get a little, little bit of the of sausage. sausage, yeah. Whoa. You've never had mac and cheese like this. <laughs> <laughs> Amid a global pandemic, changing family dynamics, and anti-Asian racism, Chinatowns across America and the communities that sustain them face a challenging road ahead. Every business that is open right now is still fighting for its life. And I think that the best way to fight the anti-Asian hate is to show our love for the community. Come to Chinatown or your local Asian American Pacific Islander restaurant, store, market. Give them your business.
We have lost so much during the pandemic and I think it makes us all so much more conscious that we have to protect what we love. If you think you know Kim Kardashian from that reality show, Keeping Up With The Kardashians, I'm just here to say you don't know nothing yet about Kim. Kim Kardashian, she's a brand, a multi-billion dollar brand with nearly 300 million followers on social media. She is the co-founder of a perfume collection, a makeup line, and so much more. But the biggest seller for Kim Kardashian is herself. People cannot get enough of this woman, of her family, her lifestyle, her choices. And while, yes, she is in the midst of a hectic work schedule, and she's also in the middle of a divorce from Kanye West, the father of her four kids, she's calmer than she seemed in a decade. She is in a new relationship with comedian and Saturday Night Live cast member Pete Davidson. She just launched another campaign for her shapewear line, Skims, and her famous family, well, they're about to embark on a new chapter of the reality show, The Kardashians. This time it's on Hulu. So what is Kim Kardashian making space for these days? Well, law school aside, she is making space for herself. Kim, it's so great to see you. I'm so happy that you have time to sit with me today. I've got a, a podcast called Making Space. And I weirdly feel like you're in a moment in your life where everything Everything is slowing down. Everything seems more peaceful and simpler. And I'm not sure if I'm reading into it, but I'm getting this total vibe about your life today, that there's a more of a calm, uh, a more calm going on. Am I right? There definitely is a lot of calm. I'd say when you have four kids, they'll never really fully be calm like ever. And I think when people say, oh, you're so much calmer now, or you seem like at peace now, I was definitely at peace and, and loving not being calm before. I don't think that there's like the two are pit against each other or that one is better than the other. I think at the phase in my life that I was at for the last decade, I've loved and it made me who I am today and I've grown and evolved, but it was super spontaneous and so much going on and so amazing. Um, I think I just like prefer now to, I work, you know, really hard and long hours and in school. And um, I think that what I choose to do with my off time now is just probably a little bit more simpler things. And so I feel more of a sense of inner calmness, but it doesn't but my life definitely isn't calm. I think people around me would be like, do you ever take a minute, you know? Um, so yes, there, there is a calmness for sure, but I loved every phase that I've been in, in my life. Not too long ago, I ended a eight year relationship and it was not simple. Did you know for a long time that it wasn't the right fit? Were you just continuing or was it something that kind of came on? No, I think that, you know, in life, it's especially, you know, I've been divorced before and it's extremely difficult. I would say getting a divorce with children is a whole other level of pain and hard times that I just didn't even know existed. Um, but I really wanted to make a decision and it wasn't a quick decision. It wasn't, you know, it was something I think just over time, spending a lot of time apart and realizing, especially during the whole like quarantine time and having to spend a lot of time together after spending so much time apart, you just realize what really makes you happy. And, um, you know, I think some people might try to think maybe it's a selfish, selfish decision because I do have four kids and I do want to be mindful of everyone's feelings involved. But I think like for once I was like, I want to really choose my happiness over anything and my peace of mind. And I think I like something just stuck out to me. Uh, my mom used to always like cry to me when I was in these, you know, bad relationships and, you know, college and years ago. And she used to say, all I want for my kids and all I want for you is peace of mind. And when I like woke up and realized that I didn't have that, 
that's all I was looking for. And so I think that no matter what, it doesn't mean that, you know, everyone didn't try and it doesn't mean that I don't wish that it, you know, had turned out differently and, and there's nothing more than you'd want for everyone to be happy. But I think it also showed a lot of personal strength for me because I was really a people pleaser and I wanted everyone else to be happy that I finally was like, why am I measuring and trying to make other people happy over myself? And that takes a lot of strength to do, even if you know that it'll make your kids upset as well for a time period. I think, you know, one day they're going to grow up and be out of the house and it's just going to be me and I'm going to have to sit there with my happiness. And, um, I saw, you know, my mom stay in a relationship too long when she wasn't as happy. And, and I just never wanted to, once I knew for sure in my heart and soul, I just wanted, I, I realized everyone's going to heal quicker if I just make the move instead of not being my authentic self and not finding my inner peace. Well, there's a great Alicia Keys song I just heard with Brandi Carlisle, and it's called I Have a Voice. And it gives me chills when I hear it because... When you're a pleaser, a people pleaser, your voice gets squished down. Sometimes it's so silent you can't even hear it. You don't even whisper to yourself anymore. You're just like, you know what? I'm just going to plod along and go along my merry way. But um, do you kind of believe that when you are peaceful, your kids will be too? Like it's almost like they feel your Absolutely. total vibe. Absolutely. I think when you're happy, your kids are happy. And even if it's hard and they don't understand at the time, I mean, I went through it and I understood it eventually with my parents. And I just think there's also, that's just a part of life. And these are also growing lessons and learning lessons for my kids too. And so I think that they will ultimately be better people when they're faced with hard times and faced with real life situations. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. How do you trust, this is something for everybody who's been in a relationship that didn't work, and then you see something that might work, but then you think, I'm not sure, I don't know. You get gun shy, you get afraid, I don't want to rot, you know, you just get afraid. But it seems to me that you followed some instinct in you, your soul or your spirit or something that said yes. This is something to try with Pete. Yeah, I think that, you know, sometimes things happen when you just least expect it. Yeah. It was like the last thing that I was really planning on. Um, and so when it did happen, we were kind of like, oh, my God, I wasn't like planning on this. And this isn't even what I was thinking of. And like, it just makes it that much sweeter and so much more fun when you just Sometimes you just can't plan everything out and you can't, you have to be open to it and you have to like, you know, I definitely took my time. I took like, you know, 10 months or something before I dated or, 
talk to anyone and I just wanted that time to really figure out and go through the motions. Am I making the right decision? How do I feel about this? Like you'll never know until you're put in situations. Um, and so once I went through all of the motions, I finally was like, okay guys, I am so ready to meet someone. And I randomly did. And I think you just, like Chloe asked me this question once. She was like, how do you know to trust a person? Like, how do you know to trust? And I was like, I've never thought about that. I've always been really trusting and I've never really had a guard up, but sometimes you just know. And sometimes you just like know when to trust. And so I just, I kind of go with it and I feel like everything has happened that could possibly happen that is heartbreaking, you know, in all of our lives. I've seen it with my sisters and my mom and just like, we all know someone that's been through a really hard time in relationships and everyone's been okay and everyone comes out okay. So you just have to like let yourself go and open yourself up to receive something and just be a good person and you'll get that back and no matter what, everyone's gonna be okay. That's kind of like my outlook on everything with life. It is, it is. Do you trust yourself again to get married again? I wanna live in the moment. I definitely want to, you know, I do love a relationship. That's the kind of like girl that I am. I don't really want to be, you know, dating around and stuff like that. But I do live in the moment. And I do think that I am holding, you know, a little bit more close to my heart on certain aspects of my relationship with Pete. And it feels good just to know that like, we have this connection and we have our little bubble of a relationship world that we live in that like not a lot of people know about. Mm. I, I think it's cool, even the little things we do know, you go, you go out for pizza, you're like, oh, everything's just cool and regular and not so, not such a we big deal. We were driving in the car yesterday and I just like looked at him and I was like, thank you. And he's like, what? And I was like, for running errands with me. Like, I, this is so much fun just to like go to a doctor's appointment or go to the dentist and just like run errands. Like I'm having so much fun. <laughs> It's so, it's like back to the beginning, back to before everything, yeah. right? I mean, and, and again, like it's not to say that any amazing big experience I had was mm -hmm. not so much fun as well and so worth it. It's just like where I'm at in life, I I feel like we worked so hard and we just want to enjoy, you know, different things. Like, and, and I'm just so content. That's a beautiful word, by the way. Okay, if you had a day that was just for you, Kim, you woke up, your kids were all being taken care of, Pete was busy. Where's this day? You open your eyes, it's a beautiful sunrise. You have one day for Kim, just for Kim. How would you, and no work, how would you fill that day? Oh my gosh, I would, I would work out because I love to work out. Um, yes. I would yeah. hopefully be waking up on the beach somewhere really beautiful mm. um, and just lay in bed all day and watch TV and movies and eat in bed. <laughs> I'm like such a homebody. I love to stay home. I love that you eat in bed. Uh, okay, some people are totally nope. against that. I have that. a dust buster by my bed, in my, in my <laughs> side table drawer. I hate crumbs in the bed. So I definitely will put down a, a, a towel. I have trays, I have the most comfortable trays and I just eat on the trays and my dust buster is always on deck. Okay, snack of choice in oh bed? Oh my God, well, I'm eating extremely clean now. I love to just eat my dinners and stuff, oh. but I mean, my favorite snacks okay, ever, yeah. like Cheetos and mm -hmm. cookies yeah. and stuff Triscuits like and like so many random little things. It's a can't miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
Monterey, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Do you feel, I feel like your life is full. Are there things that you feel like you are missing? Any puzzle pieces that aren't quite there yet? If you say, if I just, I'm just working toward that. I feel like you have so many irons in the fire that it's hard to quantify, but is there, is there something that you feel like needs to snap into place? Yeah, I really got to like get it together with law school. It's really hard. Yeah. I got to like, I got to finish. I have like, you know, almost two years left. Mm -hmm. And um, I have th I study three hours a day every day, and it is really hard. And I just can't wait. I keep on saying like, okay, I can't even entertain this business thing or this that I can't put another thing on my plate until school is done. I need to finish school, and once that happens, I will be a different human being. Do you kind of feel that sometimes you're underestimated when you walk into a room, Kim? Absolutely. And I've always been the underdog. Always. And that's okay with me. Like I'm, if anything, I like for someone to really be un like unpleasantly surprised and mm -hmm. maybe expect less and be blown away when maybe I give them more than they thought that I would ever give them, you know, but that's always mm -hmm. just been what people have perceived. And I don't know if that's mm -hmm. why I've worked so hard to try to figure it out and to try to show people. I mean, you know, your life changes and what you care about mm -hmm. can all change and grow and evolve. And so I really don't mind being the underdog and being thought differently and proving myself because I think that's what always has like kept that fire under me. Mm -hmm. Even if I didn't understand it at the time or couldn't understand certain people's decisions, I, um, I like applaud people's growth and where they're at. And um, yeah, I really just don't mind being that person and that underdog. I mean, people. can you just line out, just give me one snapshot of a day because I don't think I, I know you and I know how hard you work. There's not a harder a person who works harder. Line out your day for me. You wake up and go. I wake up at 5.40, I go to the gym from 6 to 7, 7.05, get the kids up, get them all ready for school, all four of them, help brush their teeth, get their uniforms on, eat breakfast, get them out the door, drive them to school, come back, start glam um, or study. Mm -hmm. It's like I have that few hour study mm -hmm. time or glam and or it's vice mm -hmm. versa. Then I film, and then I either go to a Skims campaign or a Skims fabric meeting, and then um, I'm, you know, relaunching my beauty brand soon. So it's like formulas and products and packaging and you know meetings all day, and then um, pick the kids up from school. Or if I'm in the middle of a shoot or something and I can't, I meet them after school. Always have dinner mm -hmm. with the kids, and then at nighttime either do my reading for studying for school or um, just do all my like skims content and organize, I'm big on organizing and making sure everything's in place. And then I go to bed, around. I put all the kids to bed and then I'm finally to bed around 10.30 myself. Oh my and then the day That's starts day. all That's over That's a again. day. Kim started the shapewear brand Skims in 2019, filling a gap in the market with underwear, shapewear, and loungewear for people of all shapes and sizes and skin tones. Today, the company is worth billions. Did you ever imagine that Skims would be a $3.2 billion company? I did I mean, not. 
I had hopes, the- obviously. I had such high hopes because I just felt like anytime there's something missing in the marketplace that you're always trying to find a solution for, other people are trying to find that same solution. Mm-hmm. So when I realized that, you know, in shapewear, there just was not size inclusivity and color tone inclusivity, I just knew that even just like where the seams were and everything that I was mm-hmm. changing on shapewear myself and wanting to perfect, I found that creating my own line was just gonna be my best bet. And I love every minute of it. I mean, I come up with mm-hmm. every campaign, every style, every fabric, I'm at every campaign. Like, it's just, e- even doing the one with the, the my favorite icons, you know, I wasn't supposed to be mm-hmm. in that campaign. I just went to go see how they were doing and bring a beignet truck for them as a little <laughs> treat. And they were like, oh no, no, you're getting in this campaign. You're getting in. And I was like, oh my God, what? I I wasn't prepared and I didn't get a spray tan and I didn't, you know, and they were like, who cares? Get in it. You're in. And you did. And I did. And it was so much fun and I'll have that memory forever. But I just have so many fun ideas that it's like my baby. You know, anytime I work on something now, it has to be like, I'm so obsessed. It's my baby. I can't, you know, wait to just show people what we have coming. And it's so much fun. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive... Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Well, keeping up with the Kardashians, we all saw, we watched as you bid that farewell. And sometimes when something's done, it's done. You just lock the box and say, that was a good ride. See you later, alligator. But something happened. This thing got another life. Uh, It's on Hulu. So what was it that made you decide, maybe we're not done yet? Um, In all honesty, a bidding war from streaming services came in. And we just were like, okay, how can we? We worked so hard for so many years. And like, it was, you know. So it's the best lesson, but then it was just a really good opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. And we thought, you know what, let's take a year off. Let's not film for a year and let's let life happen. And we did. Mm-hmm. And then we all knew that we were going to miss it. Like we just were like, it yeah. was a bittersweet thing where we just felt like our time mm-hmm. on the network was up and our time just together like that was up. And then just coming together again was so much fun. The first day of filming was so weird. We were just, Why? we couldn't believe that we were filming again. And, and just like the way that we film is a little bit different. I think the viewer would love to just see, or hopefully they'll love it, just how documentary style it is and just how individual mm. it is. And you see mm-hmm. each sister and family member really on their own and kind of separate. And then we kind of all come together where the last show was like, all together all the time Mm -hmm. so i think just knowing that it was going to be a little bit different and that's such a scary thing like to start over and to you know because keeping up was so iconic we're so close Mm -hmm. to the producers you know we loved everyone and it was like how do we start over is are we making such a big mistake should we have just left it there but i think after seeing the edits and and seeing how it's shot and we're so excited and i'm just so excited for the viewer to see it well, I have to talk about just you and your sisters for one second, because I remember, it was 
years ago, but Kathy Lee and I went because Kendall was in a fashion show. Uh, she was walking the catwalk. And when we got there, all of you guys were there. There were no cameras. There was nothing. You guys were screaming like it was the first time you'd seen Kendall on the catwalk. Oh, I know. And I said in that minute, that's why the show's successful. Because they love each other. Camera lights on, camera lights off. They're supporting and they're screaming to her like, like they had never seen her do it before. And I was cracking up and Kathy Lee's like, that's how they are, of course. But that's the magic, isn't it? Like, that's the thing that makes Kathy people lean in. Kathy used to say that all the time. She used to say, yeah. like, you guys, when we were kids, like, like yeah. super young, she would be like, I, I was a teenager. And she would, she would say, like, you guys are insane. Like, what, where's the camera? Like. <laughs> <laughs> reality TV was just starting out, and she was like, you guys just have to have your own show. This is insane. Yeah, um, she said it, yeah. But I think that we're the same, you know, <laughs> cameras on, like you said, cameras off. I mean, there's not mm -hmm. one of my friends from high school that can say I'm any different now than I was back in high school. Mm -hmm. And I think we've just always maintained that. And I feel so lucky that we've had each other as a family to come up together. I mean, to think about it, we mm -hmm. all got our first check together. We all bought our first car together. We all bought, you know, got our first play. Like we had each other. We all ran into mm -hmm. our first celebrity that we were freaking out over. Like we had every same experience yeah. together as a family. So it's like just different than one of us moving out here from, you know, a different state and calling the other sister saying, oh my God, guess who I just met? Or, oh my God, guess what I just got? Like. We just, we kind of were able to share every experience together, which I think is pretty cool mm -hmm. and has kept us super grounded. But yeah, we support each other no matter what. We fight just like every family. I mean, I think that when we started filming, we couldn't have even imagined half the stuff that was gonna happen and go on mm -hmm. in our lives yeah. filming. I mean, we thought, how are we gonna get to a season two? We have nothing to film mm -hmm. about, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just feel lucky that we're starting a new journey. Um, on Hulu and and I hope that the fans like it just as much as they liked keeping up. I feel like we're rushing a hundred miles an hour and I feel like you know they talk about how the the top layer of the ocean is very very tumultuous but if you go down deep it's calm and it's peaceful and up on the top layer they say it's like it's the things you gotta do. I gotta I gotta pick up the kids, I gotta go to work, I gotta get to the meeting, I gotta check on the skims but if you go deeper it's calm and peaceful. What, what do you hope to make space for in this coming year in your life? I just hope to make as much space for my kids, to be honest. Mm. I try to spend so much time with them. I actually hope to make space for myself, too, just to have, mm. you know, a little vacay without the kids, maybe, or, yeah. you know, just I think that's super important is to always make space for yourself, but, but to make mm -hmm. space for your kids when they really need you and just make sure that you're there to do homework and all the little things add up to, to the big things. So I just, mm -hmm. um, I do make space for that and I just want to continue to do that. Yeah, my favorite parenting hack when I'm asking my kids something is, the only thing I say to them is, tell me more. That's it, my only line to them and then all of a sudden out comes the entire day. Yeah. When I start That's asking them specifics, that they don't, they don't, they're like, I don't know, nothing. Tell me more, and they go, let me think of some. Oh, guess what happened, Mom? And they tell me some beautiful story. Yeah, oh, I love that. I'm gonna use that, yeah. I'm gonna steal that from you. It's a good one. Kim, I love you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Oh my gosh, love you. Thank you for having All right. me. You got it, we'll talk to you soon. Bye.
First of all, it's great to see you, Jeff. It's so great to see you. Wait a minute. The only the one of the oh. times I've seen you. Yes. Let's review. Sure. Let's have a drink. I and think review. only at the yes, please. Cheers. I think it cheers. I, now, is it incorrect to 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 toast to to, to clink water with water? It is. It's bad luck, as a matter of fact. So we'll have to bring out some hard liquor if you yeah. have it. But I say break the rules. You, Let's you, do it. June 9th is the 29th anniversary of the premiere of the first Jurassic Park movie. Is that true? 29 well, years ago in DC. Does that feel like a lifetime ago? Does that feel like yesterday? What's your sort of perspective on this Jurassic run? I'll tell you, when Laura Dern mentioned it to me the other day, I had forgotten. As I sit here, I can't really remember. It's the truth of it. <laughs> Washington, DC, as distinct from anything else, I don't remember that we were there first. I don't know. It's kind of, anyway, it's, it must be a long time ago, or I'm going dim, some bridges are. Well, no, you're forgiven. There were many premieres, I'm sure, to that movie, and it, it was a long time ago. It feels a long time ago and, and kind of recent, you know, and, and kind of recent. Um, and I, I don't know that it, it changed my life. Not, not like you'd think professionally, I guess, in retrospect, but I don't have a recollection of feeling like, golly, my life has changed, you know what I mean? With all that said though, yes, Jeff, sir. what is it like to be back here now in, in this movie, something that was a long time ago, yeah. doesn't feel like it. What's it like to be sitting here back in the world of Jurassic? Uh, privileged, I feel lucky. I don't take it for granted. It certainly wouldn't have been predictable or expected 30 years ago. When I was a kid, I was hot about the idea of being an actor. And I knew it was a long, shot to ever get to do it. Uh, so, and I'm still aware of that, the fact that I've gotten chances to keep doing it kind of not uncommonly, continually over now a longish period of time is I feel privileged and appreciative of it and to be in a movie that um, if nothing else kind of, uh, you know, gets people's attention, entertains them and means something to them uh, here and there. You know, it's awful fun. And to work with creative people. Now, that's the thing that I really did focus myself on. I was hot to not only be an actor, but to have this creative adventure. Mm. And I had a good teacher, Sandy Meisner, who said, you know, here's, here's a worthwhile way to spend your life. And you can keep getting better at it for, forever. And so that's been important to, to me. And to be back with Laura, and to be back with Sam, back with that team, yes. and conjuring such nostalgia for those of us who loved the first one, yeah. the seeing the three of you together, what was it like to walk on set with them? Uh, fantastic, fantastic, uh, great. You know, I'd been prepared in my mind for some months and been working on it. And then we contacted each other over the phone what do you, you know, how's this going to go and what can we do? And da, 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 da. Um, but yes, but then I saw them. We all, you know, we were the first production out in the bubble yeah. uh, caused by COVID. And Sam and Laura had found out when I was arriving and were there stationed on some little balcony and gave me a very sweet and uh, crazy, um, uh, uh, you know, hello. And then uh, we embraced it. Was, it was great. And then the first day on the set, the three of us were there kind of improvising and doing things. And we showed up and she said that uh, Colin Trevorrow, our wonderful director, took a picture and she saw the crew and they were all kind of interested and a little bit, mm. you know, emotional and like that and made her emotional. And then he, Colin sent that picture to uh, Mr. the great Mr. Steven Spielberg who said back to him and he re related to us that he was emotional, you know. So it was... Uh, it was emotional. I, what I remember from it was very sweet being with them. But what I remember is that it was a very focused kind of playtime, you know, work mm -hmm. time, uh, to kind of get, get it right. So we went to work. You went to work, and you went to work well, and you stepped back into a story for people who are getting ready to go see this, where we now find the dinosaurs. I won't give too much away, but we're having to coexist and to live in the same spaces as dinosaurs. So what else should somebody who's going to go out and watch this know about where we find ourselves in well, Jurassic World? Yes, dinosaurs are all over the world, so it's kind of an epic in scope uh, little story that takes us all over the place. And, um, and the three of us don't have just little 
tidbits. Uh, you know, we're not just a garnish on a sweet platter, but you know, we have nice, nice little parts. So we're all over it if that interests anybody. And uh, what, what else? It's a movie that you want to see in the movie theater because yes. it's uh, big and uh, loud. We're going to take our kids, as a matter of fact, for the first time to see a, a movie in a movie theater. Uh, this coming Sunday. Oh, their first ever movie yes. will be Dad's movie. Yes, that's never cool. Never seen it. I mean, uh, yeah. Have you seen the movie? Have you sat and watched I've, it yet? I've I've seen it twice, and I had a great experience. I'm not just selling it, but I was kind of very with it, and um, and on the edge of my seat. And there are a lot of jumps in it. The dinosaurs yeah. made me jump a bunch of times, you know, which is sort of enjoyable. Um, <laughs> and then uh, and the characters by that time, and now we've been immersed in spending time with each other doing this publicity. So I was very kind of talking about it. So I was very kind of immersed in the ca characters. And uh, the dinosaurs and I was even kind of choked up and mm. kind of, I was really with it, you know. So I loved it. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. This is a critical turn point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. West Homestead. Yeah, yeah. You, Have you ever been around Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh, all? yes. I don't think I've been to West Homestead. Yeah, you know, it's a little it's there, hamlet right. there, you yes, know, off in the, the suburbs. Yeah. It seems to me, reading everything I have read about you, you knew so young that you wanted to be an actor in a place that wasn't known for cranking out actors. Oh, you were oh. writing in the fog of the mirror, yeah, yeah, yeah. let, me be, let me be an actor, all that. Yeah, I was obsessed by it, but that was like in ninth, tenth grade when I took these couple of Carnegie Mellon uh, six-week summer courses in acting, and that, that, then I was, you know... Obsessed. Where did that come from, that obsession? I think around 10 that happened, and it was that, you know, my dad had said, if you find something you love doing, uh, that might be a vocational guide, guide post. And, uh, and then I was in this camp that I loved, that was different than the kids that I went to school with, and I loved it, and came alive there. And there was a drama course there, and I jumped on stage, and afterwards they said, well, how'd you like that? They were there, my parents were there, and I went... Yeah, I, yeah, I, I like that, you know, mm. but I kind of kept a secret to myself that that's, I wanted to do it. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. thrilling, right? You, it's a collaborative thing. People clap for you after you do it. Yeah, clapping is okay. But yes, it was, I remember people laughing during this thing. I played this part and, and uh, yeah, it was thrilling. It was, I'll tell you, I was backstage. I remember being backstage in this chapel theater. It was a kind of nice, nice, nicey theater. I remember, I think even now, f thinking to myself, I have, I'm not prepared to do this. There's nothing, I mean, I worked on a little bit. I don't know what I'm going to do. How do I know what to do? And I, I had to actually leap on stage. But, uh, and, you, you know, uh, and I took that leap, and I guess it was even spiritual and psychological mm. and metaphorical, uh, out of nothing that allowed me to have this thing and experience and that still kind of means something to me now, this mm. sort of leap out of nothing that for any moment of life is the way to go, you know? Uh, I still am kind of thrilled and romantic about it. And you took a massive leap coming here to New York as a kid. You were still a kid, 17 years old. Yes. How did that conversation go with your parents? Well, <laughs> okay, actually, my dad was a doctor. Yeah. And, um, 
And I had enrolled, I had um, applied to Carnegie Mellon University, who said, hey, he was good in the summer sessions, he should apply to the regular school. I did a bad audition, I think. I was not prepared. They turned me down, and I hadn't applied to any place else. And my dad, I told you, he said, find something you love to do. I remember in ninth grade, when I, in the summer, when I came home, kind of all jazzed up and talking about what I'd learned, whether it was, uh, we were taking a mime course, believe it or not. And I was thrilled about a lot of, a lot of things. And he said to my mom in front of me, look at that, the, the kid is stimulated. Mm. And I remember the way he said it, I thought, oh, that's important to him. And uh, yes, I get, you know, it was important to me, it became important to me. So any, anyway, um, so anyway, he was okay and they were okay with it and supported it. And, uh, and then before long, I started to get jobs and, you know, make, make a living at it. And there you go. That's, you're here, you start finding jobs. You were great as freak number one in Death Wish. Your first movie. Yes. <laughs> yes. Annie Hall and The Big Chill. Which movie felt to you like, this is my break? I'll tell you, in retrospect, I suppose we can say, well, it was good professionally. That was kind of a break. But not, nothing felt like the day after or, hey, I got my break. Or, and I wasn't focused. I wasn't, my, that's not my sensibility. I wasn't going, I need a break. I need to break into, you know, get a break. I was continuing to learn, happy that, Gee, I hope nobody finds out that I'm not an actor yet, because Sandy Meisner, the other side of the mm -hmm. coin of this nice idea he had, is I'm not really an actor yet. I'm just practicing and trying to become an actor. So I was happy to, and I think it was lucky that I got little chances to kind of see, see what I could do. So it was like that. But as we look at it now, yes, all those things kind of led to each other, and then the big chill in 83, and... Da, 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 da. I did 10 speed and brown shoe. Mm. Last time I saw Ben Vereen was in this room, believe it or not, where we were right? playing here. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He came, very wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, and then da 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 da. And then that's 83. Oh, the fly, the fly. happens in 86, 87. Yeah. Is the fly the one, though, where now I know who Jeff Goldblum is for sure? He's me I know or his other name. people? Or no, other, other people. people. Other people? <laughs> no. Yeah, he's a. <laughs> I hope you knew it before then. He's a, I know what Jeff Goldblum is. He's a mon monster of sorts. He's a half, a, a heart, barely human. Uh, yes. Um, but well, that, the success of that movie obviously impacted the way people saw you. I, I, yes, I think so. And, uh, you know, professionally. But still, the main thing for me is that it was a creative landmark. And working with David Cronenberg, terrific. And on that material, gee, I had a juicy and gro growth-producing time of it. Uh, and then, yeah. Yes, it, it, it was, it was uh, nice for me, wasn't it? It maybe had led to other things. But even now, I don't know that I could connect the dots and say that led absolutely to that. If it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't... I, I don't know. It's tough, tough to measure. So after The Fly, about seven years later, comes the first Jurassic Park movie. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, you've got... There's well, obviously that. some work in between there. Yeah. But this is a next step. I mean, I know you downplay how it changed your life and all those things, and that's fair, and you don't think about the commercial success of it, but... Yeah, but it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Jurassic Park is a very lucky thing. And uh, like I said, well, we've already talked about it, Steven Spielberg and the people with whom you work and doing this stuff. But yes, uh, people coming up to you, how the fans feel about it is nice, and that's a big deal. That's a sweet thing. And yeah, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a good, nice thing for an actor to, for me to have ha had, had gotten to do. That's true. Are you aware of the endurance of your line, life uh, finds a way? <laughs> I like you it. still hear it? Life. Uh, finds a way. Isn't it funny to think you delivered it the way you thought it would sound right 30 years ago and here you're still seeing it on posts online and people saying it as they go about their lives. Yes, you know, it'll be forgotten soon enough and all this, <laughs> all our activities here will be fleeting and we'll, we'll turn to dust. Now well, we're getting real deep. Eventually. That's well, painfully true. We know yeah. that. It's, a, yeah. it's, it's not, not a secret. But for now, fleetingly, eh, it's sweet that, you know, it's not entirely disposable and that 30 years, as quick as that really is and on the cosmic calendar, it's nice and interesting and crazy that, yeah, things pop up and, you know, you see things. That's, that's cute. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Let's go. This is a critical trip. 
never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. People watch you from the outside, and I get to see you up close in a way most people don't. And it feels like you move through life with joy, absent of cynicism. You just sort of appreciate all the things that come through your life. Is that how it really is? Is the Jeff Goldblum we believe to exist the one who is? Well, I'm not pretending in any way, you know. Uh, I try to be authentic, even in my presentation here. Um, so. Uh, yeah, 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 yes. So, yes. I mean, I have moments and d all different parts of me that can, uh, you know, get, get, you know, chew on some miserable bone, you know, that's fun to chew on for a second. Uh, but no, I, you know, I'm still a humble student. And uh, however it happened, I'm lucky. My life with these kids and Emily, it seems to be full of uh, vitamin A and uh, possibility. But I still, yes, like to, I'm a student of, and was listening today to some wisdom of one kind or another about how to be creative and live creatively, mm. and how to live uh, uh, optimally. Is that the word sure. I want? You know, and that's a good question. And I'm still engaged in it and uh, trying to do today better than I did yesterday with leaping uh, into life and 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 appreciating it, being grateful for it, and seeing what I can give to it, uh, and what's here, uh, you know, uh, which will be gone soon enough uh, to appreciate. I think what's special about you as well is your curiosity and your presence. You do seem to, whoever you're with, you're in that moment, or wherever you are, you are in that moment in that well, space. That's the I aspire to that, and you know my life studies uh, overlapped with my acting technology. Sandy Meisner was a good teacher and like all other good teachers too, he had a particular, um, a particularly effective and interesting way of teaching how to be in the moment. That's what actors talk about, that's the cliche, but, but you, that, that's what you gotta do. Cause you're, make, you're pretending, so like life, you have to infuse it with a little bit of uh, acceptance of the and receptiveness to spontaneity and then creating the illusion of spontaneity so you got to be entirely available to hear the other person's line which you may know in part of yourself what it's going to be but you've got to be particularly available and engaged in besides the line the deeply interesting mysterious infinitely fascinating uh, that is the other human mechanism, that is mm. that person over there. Because you're part of the cosmic, the Big Bang is in you. Mm. And I don't know everything about you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then you gotta pretend moment to moment. That's the acting <laughs> part of it. But right. yeah, that's a little riff on me. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think there's infinite knowledge out there for us to grab onto and know and learn about. So you can't ever just sit back and not pursue it or at least be curious about it. Doctor, you're wasting time. your time. 
There's something about here on Earth. You know, we yes. live on a special that we could easily take for granted. Yes. We live as part of this movie, the Jurassic series. This Earth is pretty magnificent, and the other creatures with whom we share it are, forget dinosaurs, are various and magnificent and deserve our deserve equal safety and um, liberty as we have and uh, our uh, wonderful coexistence. Oh, I could talk about this all day with you. They're gonna throw us out of here eventually though. Uh, before I ask you to uh, play a tune on the piano, if you don't mind, oh, sure. um, the reason we've had to see so much more of you lately is because of your reality show. A successful two seasons yes. with Jeff Goldblum. How much fun do you have with that? I did have fun, you know. I did have fun with that Disney Plus. You could go see yeah. the 22 episodes. So I had a good time. Yeah, yeah, they were very good, and we made nice little. Do you keep doing it? Do another season of it? Or we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Yeah. I don't know what we're going to do. There could yeah. be more, but I had a nice, uh, you know, belly full of uh, satisfying portion of it. 22 episodes. Can you imagine? We went all over it. You know, it keeps That's you work. Yeah. keeps you busy. I know you've sure. got a, an extraordinary constitution, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's an investment. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. So how does music fit into your life then? You've played this room, by the way, many times. Not many times, no, for you one were, week. Oh, it was we only played a week. for one week. Uh, okay. It was a special, it was a special uh, a week. It was uh, fun. And like acting, your love of jazz and your love of music goes all the way back to your childhood, doesn't it? Yeah, around 10 or so, I, I forget. My, we had, there were four of us kids. Our parents gave us lessons. My brother played the clarinet. I played uh, the piano. Was bad for the first couple of years. Didn't want to practice. You know, didn't know what discipline was like then. Doing your homework, you know. And then he gave me a jazzy piece, and I was like, I, I like this. Something about me that just kind of responded to syncopation and something like that. So I practiced and learned how to play that. And then around that time, I had my heart set on acting as a career. But I got it into my head to, because I didn't have summer jobs or anything like that. Um, to get the telephone boy, the yellow pages, and look at cocktail lounges around Pittsburgh. I was 15, and go and call up, cold call them, and say, uh, you know, I hear you're looking for a piano player. I started to do that, and in the same vein, I kind of kept a piano with me. I did Broadway, you know, Broadway musical or two, and was down in the pit playing with the musicians. I just loved it, loved musicians, and put it in a movie or two. There's my character in the fly plays yeah. for a second, yeah. and then about 30 years ago. Somebody said, uh, it was Peter Weller, in fact, who said, come on, let's play out and about. And, uh, you know, have a little band. And the, a core band, kind of, I ca I've kept it up whenever I'm not working. And we made a couple albums and yeah. this and that. And, you know, we wound up playing. So it's a part of my life and, uh, which is very fun, unexpected, non-careerist oriented. But my daily life includes, before the kids get up, usually, always, I work out in the gym and do my little workload of piano. That changes my day, changes my life. Music is a tonic, mm. as you know, and uh, it's a, a great. Thank, thank you to Shirley once again mm. and Harold for giving me piano lessons. All kinds of gifts from your parents. That's correct. Truly. Yeah, that's correct. Great. All right, should we play a little music? Do you take requests when you go to a party? You sit down at the piano, people say, Jeff, please play this. Or do you say, here's my set list? 
No. <laughs> what I like to do is go through, I, I like to cold read. I like to, um, uh, a lead sheet, you know, jazz yeah. players. So I go through the fake books. I like to play anything like that. Oh, I was, I like New York in June. You know that song? Mm hmm. Uh, how about you? I like a John Williams tune, mm. et cetera, et cetera. How about the Jurassic themes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's all. That's what is it like, Jeff, to play a room like this at the Carlisle? Sweet. You know, recently we played the Disney Concert Hall, believe it or not, 2,000 seat wow. thing, and we did that in Houston and Washington, which is very nice, but uh, it's, a, it's, it's particularly um, delightful to play a nice room like this, and this particular room with this history and lovely, you know, ambiance and... Uh, it's great. Have you been here a lot to see people? I've, I'm not a lot, but a few times I have. It's the intimacy. I mean, this is people can't see at home, but it is a tight room. It's, it's that's tight. Great. It's a little room, and I yeah. like to talk to people, and you know, and uh, so it's uh, nice. Yeah. What do you get from playing music, Jeff, that you don't get from all the other interests in your life? Well, well, um, uh, you know, it's overlapping. It's all overlapping. Life itself is musical, and at its best, it's kind of musical, you know, and uh, vibrational, you know, even, and pulse, pulse driven, and, mm. you know, uh, breathing in and out. And, of course, it's um, like we talked about a conversation and a collaboration and a connection to yourself and musically. There are parts of yourself that can only be accessed uh, uh, through it, mm. through, through music, I think. And then you reach other people uniquely through music. And like I say, a conversation, when you're playing with jazz guys particularly, for me, they do something unexpected, and it makes you, if you're listening and connected to it, makes you do something in, resp in mm. response to it, et cetera. And that's overlapping in acting, as we talked about, and in life. But what does it give me that I don't get otherwise? Well, I have no, I've told you I'm kind of non-careerist, yeah. as I like to say, um, about acting. But I still, you know, want to put my best foot forward, and it's still my well, livelihood, you know. This, I kind of, uh, is just for fun. I really don't have to try too hard to just have fun without concern for, just for its own sake. What will you sit down and play in the, in the morning? Let's say you've just had your personal time in front of the piano. I would tell you, I, I'm not going to bore you with that, but I run through, I run through, I don't need any music now for it. I run through my whole thing. I start with these days. <laughs> I run through that song and then about 40 other songs, some of which I sing along with, and da -da 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 -da. and then I finally get to our second, the bulk of what we did on the last album. So, for instance, this is from that album. And I'm kind of making up this variation. You know, it's like jazz. That. Make it up as you go. It's a little bit of jazz. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sort of making that up. How I approach jazz, how jazz, I'm trying to learn how jazz, good jazz people approach it, is um, I may have a vision or an idea of, and a sensibility and a taste in the circle that I'd like to hit, and a kind of an idea, and people I, I love, and you know, parts that I'd uh, like. But really, you see how the waves come in, uh, just like in jazz, and you uh, surf them, you know. <laughs> and see, see how you can navigate them. You don't get to pick what the wave's doing. You just have to figure out how to ride it, right? But you said it much better than I did, unsurprisingly. <laughs> I was summarizing. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> You're a great, great. Pleasure. What a pleasure. Man, my pleasure so entirely.
everybody. Great to be back with you for a brand new Pop Star Plus when we're gearing up for that final episode of Stranger Things with an interview with one of the show's stars. And we had the great pleasure of having Steve Carell in the studio. That was just this morning, Studio 1A. We're going to share that conversation with you. And later, we've queued up a fun 90s throwback with Kathy Bates to celebrate her birthday today. All that is coming up at first, today's Pop Star Headlines. Chris Martin is first up on Popstar today. From the world's biggest stages to a tiny barroom stage, the Coldplay frontman is proving that he can do it all. He recently surprised a lucky couple when he was visiting the Stag Inn. We'll give him the credit. It's a bar over in the UK. After a quick chat with them about their wedding, Chris just decided to give him a little private performance. Take a look. <laughs> What's your name again? Hannah. Hannah. And? Jeremy. Jeremy. You're getting married in a minute. In, no, 28th of August. Oh, yeah, but he's doing the food. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Alf, and that's Alfie's, <laughs> pi Alfie's piano. <laughs> <laughs> by the bar like yeah the guy th thinks he's Chris Bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's going on in there yeah. of course if like any good bar what do you do you tweet that video oh, out oh, yeah. and now people stop in they're hoping to see yeah. this moment uh, Chris visiting oh, them but what a they wrote he's a lovely guy he ordered a Guinness of course oh, there you go he's Please. the perfect man all right next up focus focus to <laughs> Kevin Ford and Chris Martin like the same people <laughs> Disney just dropped the first teaser trailer for the highly anticipated sequel it's been almost three decades since the Halloween cult classic debut and all three of the original Sanderson sisters have returned for the next chapter. It's Bette Midler, Sarah Jessica Parker, and Kathy uh, to Jimmy. They are back to terrorize Salem, get their revenge, and maybe put on one more memorable concert. Maiden Mother and Crown Two. We call on thee with one request. Help our intentions manifest. Lock up your children! The Sanderson sisters. I bet you're looking for the stage. Always. <laughs> I don't know if I ever saw the first one, but that reminded me of Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board. Oh, yeah. Light as a Feather. Jim. So scared. Yeah. My mom said never play that at yeah. a sleepover. But you did, didn't she? What is Maybe it? once or twice. You don't know Light as a Feather, Stiff as a Board? No. You ever have oh. a sleepover? It was it, like the trying sleepover. Trying to levitate a friend of yours. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah, using oh. yeah. powers. That focus, and the Ouija focus, board. Focus, Another oh, thing, scary. never do the Ouija board. That's right. Until right Mattel came out with a game of it, I think. Uh, September 30th, uh, Disney Plus, you can see Hocus Pocus 2. Bruce Willis is up next. The actor headed to the big screen in a new action flick called The Wrong Place. Back in March, Willis announcing his plans to step away from acting after being diagnosed with aphasia, a condition that affects a person's ability to communicate. In his latest role, he plays the guy that we love, a former cop on a mission to rescue his daughter. Here's a peek. Call your dad. I'm just at the cabin, and I wanted to make sure that you're still coming. Why do you need to get to my dad? Fix what's broke. What? You made a crucial mistake. I'm going to do what I do best. Nothing personal, pal. You're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. See, and I'm going to watch that movie. That's yeah, what I do. Yeah, of course. Wrong guy. So that's going to be in theaters on demand also on July 15th. Next up, America's Got Talent in a preview for tonight's audition round. 23-year-old opera singer Marissa Beddoes wowed the judges with her ability to hit high notes. Not only that, but also impressed, doing some impressions of some pretty famous voices. So what she did is she gave Heidi Klum like a die and had different names of singers on and asked her to wow. call for various impressions while she was singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Wow. wow. Stevie and upon a star and wake up where the clouds are flying behind me. Celine Dion. We're just met a lemon dress way above the chimney tops and that's where Over the rainbow. Why then a why can't I? Oh, that's perfect. This is funny, too. Okay, that's oh. pretty good. Okay. Oh. I, I think it's not like a golden buzzer. buzzer. Yeah, right. golden buzzer Come on. Time. We're going to find out what happens tonight. Watch NBC and you can see how it all went. And here's a few more headlines for you, including the movie Barbie that everybody cannot wait to see. We got a little sneak peek for you of the cast. 
I mean, look at some of these names. Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, Kate McKinnon, and Will Ferrell. Some new photos from the set revealing a first look at the superstars and their characters. They snapped them yesterday in Los Angeles. Robbie and Gosling rocking some very bright colors as their characters, Barbie and Ken. In head-to-toe neon, the actors were caught skating along Venice Beach and having a good laugh. Wearing a more muted shade of Barbie pink was actor Will Ferrell, who donned some skates of his own. And according to The Hollywood Reporter, Will is set to play the CEO of a toy company in the movie. But we're going to have to wait a little while for this one to see it. Barbie slated to be released next summer. And finally, Taylor Lautner. We've seen him land crazy stunts on the big screen in movies like Twilight and Grown Ups 2. Well, it turns out that Taylor doesn't need a stunt double. In a new video, the actor's showing off some serious action moves straight from a wedding reception on the dance floor. Check that out. are into it, man. That's a heck of a wedding. Talk about a dynamic duo. Well, unfortunately for Taylor Lautner, that suit wasn't made for extreme dancing at weddings, and he did rip his pants. Everybody had a good laugh at it, but it looked like it was worth it. And there you have it, your Pop Star Plus headlines still to come. That's why I don't go to weddings anymore. Brett Gelman's going to speak to us about working with Winona Ryder and, of course, all the young stars of Stranger Things. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, mean Ukrainians were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Ali Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And welcome back with the final episodes of the hit show Stranger Things set to be released on Friday. We thought we'd catch up with one of the show's stars, Brett Gelman, returns as Murray and spoke to us about working with the cast on this, the final chapter. I think Murray has very much evolved this season. He found his people more. He's a less, slightly less isolated, slightly less uh, jaded person than he was in season three because he sort of learned what it meant to have friends. So you see that development a little bit, but he's still, you know, he's still a bit of a a grouch and a, a grump. Yeah, a misanthrope, as they say. We love a good critic who calls things out how they are, you know, calls it like it is. So, and I I think that that's very much a lot of what Murray's role is in this show. It's time. It is the darkest season. And I mean, it, the approach to Murray, I mean, you know, as I as I play him, you know, I get to know him more and more. So it goes deeper and deeper. But I mean, things are always bad. My favorite part about playing Murray is that I get to be sort of the like urban character <laughs> amongst all these rural characters, and then he sort of brings like uh, a city vibe to it. Yet the Moja the Lisi.
Hi, Jim. That I get to be one of the, you know, a character of like somewhat comedic relief in this action, thriller, horror series, which is a kind of character that I grew up wanting to play, you know. And just, uh, I mean, getting to be in these like amazing action sequences and the intensity of it, you know, while still getting to really like delve into who he really is and, and the humor of it is just uh, the best, you know. I mean, getting to be in the Duffer Brothers world that they created as this character. What? Do me a favor and move your lover's quarrel elsewhere, okay? Oh, no, 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 this, no, no, no. not a lover's That's quarrel, pal. Cool. Spare me! What is your problem? Please, stop talking! No! I can't tell you much about what Murray and Joyce are up to in it, um, but uh, working with Nit Winona is like, you know, it's a childhood dream. Uh, she's one of the greatest actresses and movie stars of all time. And uh, it, I, it's, it's amazing to me that I can call Winona Ryder a friend of mine. You know, that's just, uh, it's one of those just bizarre things of like pinching myself that this is my life. And she, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun when we work together. She is like one of the kindest people and so funny. And so getting to be you know, working with her uh, on this, like almost every day that I, I worked on the show was, uh, was just like an amazing treat. <laughs> Scoop's troop, this is, hmm, Bald Eagle. I've reached another junction. This is what? The fourth junction. All right, so if memory serves, this is right after the My Little Pony thesis. We went left, so he has to go right. right. Fly right, Bald Eagle. Fly right. Roger that, fly right. No sh Seeing the teens' growth uh, has been amazing. I mean, they're really, like, just a great bunch of people really just so incredibly talented and nice and professional and fun to be around. So to see that uh, they haven't become like disaster people, <laughs> it's nice to see that that has not happened and that they've all stayed grounded. It's amazing. I'm really grateful that the Duffer brothers uh, wrote, <laughs> wrote me more stuff in the show and that they, that they made Murray's characters you know, Murray's involvement in the show grow. And it's just, it's been, it's insane. It's, it, you forget it because when you're working on the show, it just feels like family, you know, that we're just all, you know, cast and crew. It's like, we're here to do a job and get it done and have a good time together. When you step away and you are reminded just how massive the show is. I am the most excited for people to see me, uh, you know, just do amazing acting in this season. <laughs> It's just, it's really remarkable, and I think that uh, people will really, really enjoy my performance in a way that they haven't ever before. Uh, so that's very exciting to me. I'm, no, I'm, I'm really excited to, I, I just really, this season, I think it's the best season, and I think the other three seasons have been amazing, but I think the, it, it, this is everything, like, the up to the millionth degree. It is scarier, more action-packed, and funnier than, than previous seasons. And there is such an amazing balance of all of that, that, uh, I mean, it's just like, it's really, it's really awesome. Thanks to Brett for hanging out with us. And again, volume two of Stranger Things, season four drops on Friday. All right, coming up, Steve Carell, AKA Gru himself, fills us in on the latest word from the world of minions. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today.
These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories, with trusted insight, now, and expert analysis, now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to today. We got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody, good, and that's it. Yeah. And welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Steve Carell's back as the voice of the villainous Gru in the new Minions movie, The Rise of Gru, and he stopped by Studio One A to tell us all about it. Well, we are back, and check it out. Our plaza has been taken over. We've been minionized, and we love it. But what are they without the big boss himself, Gru? And we are joined now by Steve Carell, who returns as the supervillain in Minions, The Rise of Gru. But this time, Gru is 11 and 3 quarters years old and just meeting our yellow friends for the very first time. Take a look. When you guys tracked me down and responded to my help wanted ad, I was like, who oh, are these tiny tater tots? And where did they get so much denim? Steve Carell, good morning. Good morning. We meet again. I know. Can you believe that this has had such staying power? It started with Despicable One, then two, then the Minions movie. This is, I think, the, is this the fifth in the franchise? Yes. Would you have ever thought this would be the one? Not until I saw the first one. Yeah. Honestly, because it takes like a year and a half, two years to do the voice and, you know, all the animation. They animate to the voice. And, and I thought, it's a good script. It's really fun. I love the people involved. But then when you see the final product and what the animators and directors, producers yeah. do to it, uh, incredible. When they first were like, we're going to have these little yellow guys that wear denim overalls. They have like, some of them have one eye. They speak a language no one can understand, but everybody kind of understands. Understands. Were you like, oh, that's going to be a hit? Exactly. Yeah, I was like, well, good luck. Good luck with those <laughs> those minions. That's that's an ace idea. And uh, yeah, they're geniuses. It, is it the minions that is the secret to the success? Or let's be honest, is it grew? It's grew. Yes. It's <laughs> mostly grew, I think. No, the minions, the minions, and they've been described as Twinkies or tater tots, yeah. little pills. You know, they, they're. It's sort of incomprehensible to me that it became what it became. But people love them, and they're. I think it's because they're equal parts um, obnoxious and uh, endearing. They are, and mischievous. Yeah. I mean, I, I love them. I, that's the funny thing about it. It's like grown-ups like these movies, too. You were telling me even your kids, who are now young adults, wanted to come to the premiere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were so excited. And my son, after the premiere, pulled me aside and said, Dad, seriously, you know, all kidding aside about this you know in a kids movie he's like it was really good <laughs> like and i i love it because he's an aspiring film student he's like i love the shots i love the composition you know the, all the editing the timing like he really was into the movie as a movie and it was fun to see the first one came out when he was like four or five uh, and now he's 18 and so he has an appreciation in a different way that, that's high praise especially from a, a teenager yeah like just to say anything nice about anything a parent is involved in yeah. like good good on you so let's talk this is Gru's origin story. Yeah. I love that it takes place in the 70s because that's just a magical template for them to work on. The sure. outfits, the cost, the music, all of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, the music, I mean it, it's all it's it's all a big part of what the, the nostalgia of it I think is what's going to appeal to the adults. There's 
There is one joke in it about the length of time it takes to dial a rotary phone. Yes. That's maybe one of my favorite parts of Gru. It, it's incredible. Um, Gru is 11 and 3 quarters years old, which made me think about you in the 70s at 11 and 3 quarters years old. Yeah. What kind of kid were you? Well, I was really cool. Oh, really? Yeah. Like not, no nerdy no, anything? No, 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 no. I had it all dialed in. <laughs> you were, were you a bully kind of too? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I had, like, I wore, I had long hair. Yeah. And and I had, we called them flares. Oh, like bell bottoms? They were kinda, bell bottoms, yeah. yeah. I had like purple striped ones. <laughs> um, so I was kind of rocking the look. Were Remember you, fry we, boots? Yeah, I, I do. Wear fry boots. Oh, yeah. And were you like a ladies' man? Did the they, other oh, yeah. fifth graders just like you? Clearly. <laughs> And still am. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Mm -hmm. um, other than you've been married for like 50 years. <laughs> yeah. How many years That's have exactly you been married? Right. We've been married 50 years. <laughs> I know, which is odd because you're uh, 60. 27. I know. Oh, 27 years. I know. Your beautiful <laughs> wife, your kids. I was thinking about, though, like you really got big. You were in your late 30s, almost 40. And I was just thinking about that's a long time to be trying to make it big, to yeah. be a journeyman in this business. Well, I wasn't really trying to make it big. I just want, a journeyman was great for me. Yeah. I was I was happy making a living. That was that was the aspiration, just to make a living at acting. And the, the rest of it was just sort of, uh, sort of gravy, really. What's the best job you ever had? We just had Kevin Ford on. He didn't miss a shift in 27 years, which is so sweet. What's the, of all your jobs that you've had? The, well, the worst one pops to mind. Oh, I worked in the produce department of a supermarket, oh. and I had to wrap fruit in cellophane. Oh. I don't know why they did it at that point to keep it fresh. I guess <laughs> it was um, the seventies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You were eleven and three quarters. Yeah, it was. It was that was a tricky time. Yeah, and the boxes get all soggy there <laughs> in the produce disgusting. department. I know. And I was terrible at it. At one point, I was stocking popcorn on the shelves, and I accidentally poked a hole in the bag. So I took a a one of the labelers to put the price tags on and I sealed up the oh. hole with like 18 prices and then my manager said what's this and he peeled it off and popcorn over the floor clean up aisle five yep <laughs> that's exactly right thank you so much it's good to see you the movie is a delight and Thanks. it's because of you grew it's your origin story it's all about grew you're just saying that. no I'm not I love you grew and I love the minions it's from our parent company NBC Universal and Illumination but we'd be saying this no matter what because it's a fabulous movie and the kids will love it thank Thank you. Thanks. A day made better by the great Steve Carell and having the Minions here. So much fun. Be sure and check out Minions, The Rise of Gru. From our parent company, NBC Universal and Elimination, that hits theaters on Friday. Coming up, a 90s throwback with Oscar winner honoring her birthday, the great Kathy Bates. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a can't miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicky has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Welcome back. The talented Kathy Bates, who turns 73 years young today, has played so many terrific roles in her career. And in her honor, we're taking a look back here to 1998 when she spoke with us about her characters in Titanic and Primary Colors. So this has been a great time for you, it's hasn't it? It's been a it? great year. Well, first really of all, is. we should probably introduce Well, this is Griffin. Griffin. This is Griffin. I brought him with me. 
He's he's my sweetheart. He's my boy. So yeah, thanks you for rescued me bring you, you rescued him a yeah, couple years ago. A couple of years right? ago, oh, we he's, rescued. He's very fascinated him. by our interview. You're not allowed to yawn, for Griffin. So, and I brought I brought him to the to New York for the first time. He's he's more of an, an L.A. dog, so he's still getting used to the trucks and the traffic and the people and everything. And so. you get to follow him around with a plastic bag. That's right. <laughs> with a little new pink experience. plastic bag on your hand. Oh boy. All right. Well, let's get back to the movies, <laughs> shall we? Yeah. Um, tell me about how excited you were with the Titanic's incredible sweep of the Oscars. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, so many people worked on the film. It was just an amazing experience. I think the the most incredible experience was working in the dining room, you know, going and being in that scene there and, and sitting down at your place and you'd see a plate that was an exact replica of what they brought up from the debris field and the silver had all the white star insignias stamped right. on it. it Even was just the cards amazing. that had the menus. Amazing. I mean, it was just all so meticulously done, wasn't yeah. it? Was, did that make it eerie in a way? It was eerie. You know, Ken Marshall, who did the illustrated history of the Titanic, came and he just he was there the day we shot the dining room scene, and he just stood there with his mouth open and he said, "This looks, it'll never be done like this." again. He, it was as though he stepped into one of his own paintings. Yeah. Were you surprised that, that Titanic did so well at the Oscars? No. I, I think everybody expected it. You know, it's just, it's, you, you, you go and meet kids who've seen it like eight, ten, eleven times. And I get, I get so many young kids, you know, coming up to me for autographs, but I realize it's not for me. It's because I was on the boat with Leo. <laughs> I mean, let's face it, you what know, their is, eyes just glaze that over. That is so amazing. I guess he's, this generation's Davy Jones or whatever, <laughs> whoever was my David Cassidy, I'm not sure. But it's crazy, isn't yeah, it? it? Isn't is. it a bit insane? It is insane. He's such a talented, talented. I, I fell in love with him when he did who, uh, Gilbert What's eating, Gray. What's Eating Gilbert? Was he not magnificent Phenomenal. in that role? And I thought, wow, this I did guy too. is so gifted. He's amazing. He's amazing. He's a real phenom. He's a chameleon. Yeah. You know, and lovely to work with. Really sweet, yeah. isn't he? Yeah. Um, before we talk about primary colors, <laughs> yes. which I think is one of the main reasons we're here, I have to ask you about Molly Brown. How did it happen? You play, of course, the unsinkable Molly Brown in mm -hmm. Titanic. How did it happen, uh, Kathy, that she just just happened to have a, a, a dinner suit that, that fit <laughs> Jack perfectly? You know, that required a little more suspension of disbelief than I was capable of. I know, it's true. <laughs> well, we figured out that maybe, you know, she was shopping in Europe and... And it for was her for her son. son. Right. She was bringing it back for her like, son. I was like, sure. You know, like, Why didn't you well. say change that? Huh? Did you think well, that was a know. little far-fetched? <laughs> it was a little far-fetched. But, you know, it's the movies. So. Yeah, you're right. You're, I guess I shouldn't take it so seriously. Well, let's talk about primary colors because I, I confess to you during the commercial that I haven't seen it yet. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. But from what I hear, you steal the show. Well, it's a great part. It's a plum part. I play Libby Holden, who's one of his um, political operatives. And from the moment I read it, I, I just I knew it was a, a terrific part. It's Why? The best, it's the best part I think I've had to come down the pike in a long time. Better than Misery, or well, it's as good as yeah. I think. What certainly. makes it so good? Well, because you get to do the whole thing. You, it's it's the whole arc. She's crazy. She's funny. She's you know, but she's also she's profound. Outrageous, isn't and she's she? outrageous, but she's also got a lot of uh, depth, and and she's. Uh, you got the pathos as well as the comedy, you know, and it's 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 everything. It's the whole ball of wax, and and to work with somebody like Mike Nichols, who, you know, is great taste and smart, and Elaine he is May so smart. Oh, huh? he's just amazing. And not to mention John Travolta, John Travolta. And Emma Thompson, who I adore. Yeah, she's talk about great. smart. I, I mean, know she's so supportive too. We had our first rehearsal. We were sitting next to each other, and there's like a big long aria at the end that Libby has, and. After I did it, she kind of reached over and grabbed my hand and was real supportive and friendly. And it's just great working with everybody. I think the film also has some more profound things to say about the political process. It's not just about a Clinton-esque family. I think mm -hmm. it has to do with how we do elect our leaders and, and how we feel about that whole electoral process and what someone has to give up in order to become elected. Right, you know. which is certainly very much in the public discourse yeah, these days. Yeah, it is. Well, Kathy Bates, I'm really happy for all your success. Congratulations Thanks. on everything. Thanks, Katie. Great to see you. He's Griffin gone for his nap. <laughs> by everything we had to say. <laughs> anyway, good to see you. Thank you. Very cool. And of course, we are wishing a very happy birthday to Kathy Bates. And there you have today's Pop Star Plus, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hope to see you again tomorrow. Until then, make it a great one today all day. See you soon, folks.
Well, hi, look at our friends. From today all day land, and guess what? It's your favorite day of the week. Friday, baby. That's what it's they your, call it. It's your favorite day. Yeah. Uh, welcome to Today in 30. This is our half hour wrap up of everything from the show this morning. One major highlight, the amazing Charlie Puth rocked our plaza, mm. epic concert. We're gonna hear from him in just a bit. But we are gonna start with that breaking news out of Japan. The country's former prime minister shot and killed while he was in the middle of a speech at a campaign event. We're gonna have more on the investigation straight ahead. And then we actually have some good news for drivers, something we have not been able to say in quite a while. After months of record highs, gas prices finally starting to come down. We're gonna let you know what's causing the decline and more importantly, whether it's going to continue through the summer. And then on the fourth hour, we are chatting with one of Hollywood's hottest stars. Her name is Lola Tongue. It's a name you won't forget because everyone is talking about her new binge-worthy show, The Summer I Turned Pretty. It oh. was her very first television appearance wow. with us ever. Okay. So all of it's coming up on Today, Today in 30. 30. We are going to start this morning with that breaking news out of Japan. The former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe shot and killed overnight while in the middle of delivering a speech at a campaign event. The shooter has been caught, but they still don't know what the motive is. Yeah, Abe, of course, Japan's longest serving Prime Minister. He retired for health reasons back in 2020. While in office, he formed close relationships with Presidents Obama, Trump, and President Biden. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken speaking out just a short time ago at the G20 meeting in Bali. A loss, a lord, a loss for his family, a loss for his friends, a loss for the people of Japan, a loss for the world. With gun violence headlines front and center right here in the United States, we should point out incidents like this are extremely rare in Japan. There were only 10 reported gun incidents last year, and that left just one person dead. So for the very latest this morning, we go to NBC's Janice Mackey Frayer. She's been covering the shooting for us since it broke overnight. Hi, Janice. Good morning. Hoda, good morning. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe died after being shot in the chest and neck. Japan's longest serving leader in history. His death is profoundly shocking for Japan, a country where gun violence is almost non-existent. The suspected gunman was tackled at the scene. He's said to have a military background. The assassination was all captured on video. A warning, it's disturbing. This morning, a shocking attack with ripple effects across the world. Former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe shot while giving a speech in Western Japan. Video footage from broadcaster NHK capturing the moment it happened. Two shots hitting Abe in the chest and neck. Another angle showing smoke billowing. Abe was airlifted to hospital with no vital signs. Doctors say they tried resuscitating, but Abe passed away at 4.03 a.m. Eastern Time, profoundly rocking a country unaccustomed to gun violence. The suspected gunman was tackled by Abe's Secret Service detail. Police named him as 41-year-old Tetsuya Yamagami and seized what they described as a homemade shotgun. Japanese media report the suspect told investigators he was not motivated by political beliefs, but a, quote, dissatisfaction he felt toward Abe. Gun violence is exceptionally rare in Japan. Its gun laws are among the most stringent in the world. Though some guns are allowed for hunting, very few people go through the process of getting one. A person needs to pass through 12 steps, including a gun safety class, a written exam, doctor sign off, and an extensive background check to buy and own a firearm. Abe is also a political giant, the longest serving leader in Japan's history, with important ties to several U.S. presidents. He stepped down in 2020, citing health reasons. He is still one of the most visible, if not the most visible Japanese politician. I mean, there's a reason he was out on the campaign trail. The U.S., among other leaders, expressing condolences and alarm. Uh, profoundly disturbing uh, in and of itself. Uh, it's also such a strong personal loss for so many people. So it's obvious, Janice, how present and visible he was even after he stepped down as prime minister. But I'm wondering, how does the country feel about this? How big of a loss is it for Japan? 
Shinzo Abe was a, a, a political giant, uh, the country's longest serving prime minister, and in many ways still prominent after stepping down. Uh, he was credited with invigorating the economy, also reinvigorating diplomacy, uh, meeting with dozens of world leaders. He golfed five times with President Trump and took President Obama for that deeply symbolic visit to Hiroshima. As a politician, Hoda, his views may not have always been widely popular, but as a figure, he was. And that Abe's death was by gun violence uh, will deeply impact people in Japan. I don't think that point can be overstated. Hoda. Right. Janice Mackey for Air Force. Janice, thank you. Uvalde, Texas, a small town that has become yet another landmark. How long do you think it took for all this damage to occur? Can you tell us what, what it was like? With our NBC News exclusive. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. like a good time for a boost. No, I think it's always a good time for a boost. <laughs> Don't you? Here we go. A group of young guys were hanging out by a lake in Texas. One of them found himself in a tight spot. So he got stuck on a rock and he couldn't reach oh, no. the land without getting soaked. How he got there, nobody knows. <laughs> so while bystanders, including an entire restaurant full of patrons, gathered to watch, he took off his shoes and here's how it went. Uh -oh. Three, two, one. Ouch. Oh! Oh, no Was he a long jumper oh, back in my. the day? <laughs> Can you picture him? His pals were there to grab his arms, pull him up. That's called teamwork. And sneakers stayed dry. Wow. Wait, what? Let's see it again. Oh! I mean, that, that looks like it's like 12 feet at least. Holy, you're, I think you're right about the long jumper. Yeah, jump. I mean, we need to sign him up. Wow. That could have okay. gone, gone another yeah. way. So we, we're glad it did. That's yeah. a good boost. This morning, tributes are pouring in for Hollywood legend James Caan. Well, the Oscar-nominated actor best known for his role as Sonny Corleone in The Godfather he died on Wednesday. Yeah, that was some surprising news. He was just 82 years old. Harry Smith is here with a look back at his 60-year mm. career. Hey, Harry, good morning. Right. Good yeah. to see you. Well, since we heard the news yesterday, we've been running in our mind. Yes. Oh, I love that movie. Yes. I love that movie. I love that. We use the words legend a lot in yeah. talking about Hollywood folk. James Caan was an actor who absolutely deserved it. James Caan ran hot. You gotta get up close like this, but bing you blow their brains all over your nice cyber league suit. Come here. As Sonny Corleone in The Godfather, he was an unmistakable force on screen. Volatile. My sister again, I'll kill you. Combustible. Hey. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. But for many of us, our first memory of James Caan came from a made-for-TV movie, Brian's Song. I mean, I know perfectly well what's wrong with me. Yeah, I, uh, I think I'm pregnant. <laughs> Based on the true story of Chicago Bears running backs Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers, played by Billy D. Williams. One with a fatal disease, the other destined for the Hall of Fame. The 70s were Khan's decade. Cinderella Liberty with Marsha Mason. Taylor, I don't even know you. Well, that won't take long. <laughs> A bridge too far. Colonel, if you don't look at him right now, he's going to die. He's dead now. 
and thief. This is payday. It is over. You will pay me my money, $185,000. In real life, during the 1980s, the hard-charging Khan seemed destined to self-destruct. He didn't work for a half dozen years, went to rehab. The 90s, though, brought misery. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. From the Stephen King novel, directed by Rob Reiner, with Khan and Kathy Bates. I know Rob did this on purpose. He said, I'm going to get the most neurotic guy in Hollywood <laughs> and put him in bed for 15 weeks. A cable favorite we can't not watch. I love you. I love you, too. Honeymoon in Vegas is also a fave. I raise eight thousand. Tommy, I thought we were playing for fun. This is fun. And Elf. Dad! Oh, how we love Elf. I walked all day and night to find you. You look like you came from the North Pole. From Godfather to Elf. They said, we're sending you a script called Elf. I said, no, you're not. Khan's old business demeanor versus Will Ferrell's inexhaustible exuberance has made it a Christmas standard. Who sent this Christmas gram? What's a Christmas gram? I want one. I think we should call security. Good idea. I like to whisper, too. Bringing the talent of James Caan to a whole new generation of fans who are remembering today the actor and his legendary career. Oh, hair. Wow. Faves? You I, I was just going to say, oh I was going to ask you what your fave. What do you love? You know, when I first, I first heard, heard, the, heard the news, because as a kid yeah. growing up in Chicago, yeah. a Chicago mm. Bears fan. Oh, you love Brian's Brian song. Piccolo yeah. and sure. Gail Sayers story, yeah. because especially back then, that these guys were friends, yeah. mm. a black player and a white Absolutely. player, yeah. and they were like this. Yeah. That had so much so much resonance with me. I'll uh, see your Brian yeah. song and yeah. I'll go other end of the spectrum. Yeah. And, and Elf. Elf. Oh, Elf. Oh, wow. Elf. Because it's just, shows his range. Elf, How about you? Elf is a class. Elf is my, these are my, by the way, you guys both mentioned my two favorites. Yeah. Right. I loved Brian's song, I Remember Weeping. Yes. Like a baby yes. watching Brian's song. And the fact, I forgot it was a TV thing. I, I made, didn't for remember. TV made for TV movie. Yeah. Look at it, all of these pictures here I know. on the wall. I mean, you talk about a life well lived. Yeah. It just, it's and remarkable. He, and he was that? a New Yorker through <laughs> and through to the core. Well, I mean, and he tells the story, right? Because yeah. his, Godfather runs, yeah. runs, 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 runs. Yeah. There were people his whole life who said, who thought he was an actual mobster. Oh, really? <laughs> and he's a Jewish kid from Queens. Yeah. And they're like, you're a, are you a made guy? What's your deal? What's your deal? <laughs> right. Good. Harry, Good that piece. was fun. Thank, Thank you, you so much. This morning on today's Consumer Confidential, something we haven't been able to say in a while. Are yeah. y'all ready for this? <laughs> we got good news for drivers. So after months of record highs, gas prices have finally started to come down. National average, now about 29 cents below the record high that was set back on June 14th. And NBC's Aaron McLaughlin joins us with more on why this is happening and what we can expect over the next few weeks. Hey, Aaron. Hey, good morning, guys. That's right. The national average is now 12 cents lower than just a week ago. It might not seem like much, but this is the third week gas prices have gone down, a sign that maybe the worst of it could be in the rearview mirror. At the height of the summer driving season, Americans are finally catching a break at the pump. We just got to adjust to what the new normal is, and the new normal is the gas prices are coming down. Oil prices have dropped as fears of a recession take hold, while some drivers may be intentionally using less gas than before. The two key factors contributing to these lower gasoline prices are the price of oil, which has come down in the past couple months, and there's been less demand, and that may be because fewer people are driving right now. 80% of gas stations in the U.S. are now charging less than $5 a gallon. Has this made a difference so far? It's made a slight difference, yeah. Every little bit counts. Prices are lowest across the southeast and highest out west. In California, where about 12 percent of Americans live, the average gallon is still above six bucks. I haven't noticed. It's still the same for me. You know, it still burns really fast. And even in the state with the cheapest gas, drivers are still paying $1.38 a gallon more than they did at this time last year. Because stations were probably sitting on thousands and thousands of gallons of gasoline that they bought at a far higher price. So 
They're going to want to sell through that. Then they'll get access to some of the lower prices. While people may be cutting back on their day to day driving, AAA says many families are still hitting the road for summer vacation, with a record number of travelers taking to the highways over the 4th of July week. You think with these high gas prices, folks might have chosen another way of traveling, but it also came at a time where people are also looking at the issues with the airlines, with the long lines, delays and cancellations, and they may have figured, you know what, forget about it, I'm just going to go on the car. In March, 75% of people surveyed told AAA they would definitely change their driving habits or lifestyle when gas hit $5 a gallon. This morning, those changes may finally be making a difference. Hopefully we'll get out of needing gas someday. Finally, some good news, Aaron McLaughlin. Slightly less pain at the pump. So, I mean, if prices continue to drop, how low are they expected to go? Do we know? Well, according to Gas Buddy, we should see gas prices dropping a few cents a day over the next few weeks. And some analysts expect a drop to 450 per gallon nationally. It just might take a little longer than we'd like. Guys. All right. Yeah. Well, at least right. it's starting. At least it's starting. You know what? Sometimes you don't sometimes you don't notice small increments, yeah. but we're gonna pay, this, pay yes. attention. I yes. think this is good. Finally, I mean just the fact that we just said good news and gasoline right. in the same sentence we'll Aaron, take it. made us feel good. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back after 49 years of Title IX. We still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. It's a can't-miss summer on today. They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on Today. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The City Concert Series on today is proudly presented to you by City. <laughs> Our next guest has been rocking and getting people on the plaza to sway all uh -huh. morning long. Charlie Puth, Grammy, Golden Globe nominated singer and songwriter, 15 billion streams, eight multi-platinum singles. A lot. He has a new album coming out in October. It's called Charlie, and he's with us this morning. Good morning to you. Good Charlie. morning. I told you, I feel like a proud auntie. Yeah. <laughs> we co-hosted together how many years ago? I know we did. I'll never forget that day because attention went straight to number one. After oh, really? Right when we had a Can I get a royalty check? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah. you're right. Right. Yeah. But no, That's his parents funny. were That's here, funny. whatever, and now you're all fancy. So how does it feel, though? I mean, seriously, you've had a journey. I, I, I have had a journey, and it doesn't feel like work when I come here anymore. It does feel like very family-oriented. I, I think this is my seventh it time. That's seventh awesome. Seventh time That's on awesome. here. So yeah. Yeah. You're we'll like the it. house band now. <laughs> yeah, we'll I take know. It, we'll take it. You know, I've, I've always wondered about it. I've always loved your music, and every, it's like everything you put out. It's just so catchy. It stays in your head. You write a lot of songs for other people, too. Mm. I do, yeah. So how, how do you decide what to keep for Charlie mm. and, and what to sell to, to a friend? It all, it all depends on the artist. There's, um, 
by the Kid Leroy and Justin Bieber. The I do the same thing. I you told did you. that? Uh, yeah, I wrote that song <gasps> oh, with yeah. a couple of friends. I would have kept that, Charlie. <laughs> no, well, so everybody asked me why didn't she keep that? It was never my song to begin with. I had been listening to a lot of Chicago records from the wow. '80s and night before, and. Uh, when you slow that piano part down, bum, 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 bum. If you slow it down, dun, 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 it sounds like sugar, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to make something like that. So I went to my keyboard, and Leroy walked in and started singing the melody that I was playing. And usually, it, with a complex melody, with a lot of notes, you want to counterbalance it with mm -hmm. like a little about a nose, you know. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, I, we're like, I did play the clarinet. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I know what But you he mean. made that song his own. It was never awesome. my song. I just did a little drum. Yeah. And then, bam. So what's going on with you and BTS? Oh. Right? I'm looking at videos last night, and I said, uh, the, who, the, 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 who's that guy? <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Well, I have, with Jungkook, he's featured, um, he sings the song mm -hmm. uh, Left and Right with me, which I performed not too mm -hmm. long ago out there. And... I always want my collaborations to be with those uh, that I've performed with before, have some sort of musical vibe yeah. with. It's not like a record label thing, like these two would work great together. I thought it, that's how it worked. It sometimes works, but not for me. Yeah. And I produced the record in uh, mind with somebody like singing it with me, and I thought, why not Jungkook? I've had this musical history with him. I've yeah. been to South Korea before, and yeah, there, there's us in the music that's video. Awesome. He's wearing all pink. and. That's us doing a really complicated neck shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of classic. I feel like, Mama, I've made it when you do one of those like circular shots. You yeah. know, it's interesting because I am a proud auntie of yours. I remember right. when you started hanging out with your buddy Elton John. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, man, that's pretty cool. We're neighbors. That's the coolest oh, part. Oh, you really are. I, next door neighbors, we were working on, um, I started off his album with him right during the pandemic. And... I, he gave me his address and it was walking distance. The the Google icon for oh, driving crazy. didn't even show up. I just walked right across that's the street. Awesome. But he tells you at one point your music sucked. We were. She was trying. Harry was trying not to use that word, but it right. is. He's well, I said it. For yeah. Him. Well, he he was he, he was he was not as harsh as I make 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 it out. He was just very honest with me, and I really appreciated Absolutely. that because nobody had been honest with me. Because there's a, sometimes a time where like oh, yeah. you don't want to step on the exactly. artist's toes. Exactly. Uh, Charlie. Well, listen. Thank you. Yeah, you thank are you. a delight. Thank you. We're so happy for your success. Pleasure. Charlie's new album. It's out October seven. You can pre-order it today. Hey, that's what that's we right. want. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, everywhere I turn, people are talking about the hit Prime video show, The Summer I Turn Pretty. We cannot wait to catch up with its breakout star, Lola Tung. Okay, Lola plays Isabel, a teenager navigating a drama-filled summer with childhood crushes, beach bonfires, and the occasional dip in the pool. Take a look. One, two, three! <laughs> How's the water? Oh oh, guys, I hurt my ankle. Come on. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. Good to go, girl. 
Lola, hi. hi! We should point out, before we get started, this is your very first acting role, and is this your very first television appearance? It is, yes. Wait, what? Wow. I'm very excited to be here. How do you feel uh, in this moment that oh you're in? Oh my gosh, I'm so excited, I'm thrilled. How I'm excited happy to are you that I'm here? It's yes. <laughs> really the question. You must be over so the moon, excited. that's great. Well, Lola, we're so excited for you. So every now and then, like, a moment happens in your life. You're busy going to college, doing your thing. <laughs> And all of a sudden, in a minute, your life changes. What happened? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, in my second semester of my first year of college at, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And um, I had just started working with my manager. And she sent me this audition and was like, I think, you know, you'd be really right for it. And I uh, sent in tapes, but I, you know, was very focused on school and my what education. I was studying acting. Acting. So, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay good. Know. Good. But, um, yeah, I was, I was very focused on school. And... Um, I sent in these tapes, and then I heard that they wanted me to test for the role and to read for the role, and I was like, oh, my God, this could, you know, really be something Change possibly. your life, yeah. I feel. Yeah. How and jealous were your freshman classmates that you got an Amazon show? I have to imagine they were furious. <laughs> no, I mean, everyone was so supportive and so wonderful. Yeah. I watched teacher. the show. It's, yeah, tell me. I have to say, it made me feel young. <laughs> I, I felt like I was in camp, like it was like high school summer. I mean, how, I want to yeah. ask, shooting it. Yeah. Had to do like feel as fun shooting it as it felt to watch it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And everyone in the cast is amazing and wonderful, and we we had the best time on and off set. Well, by the way, it's two hunky guys are fighting over you. <laughs> That's kind of a cool role to be in. Yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> Tell me about that part. Yeah, I mean, both Chris, who plays Conrad, and um, Gavin, who plays Jeremiah, are wonderful people and um, so easy to work with, and and so much fun to just be around. So I I feel very lucky that. You know, we had such a wonderful friendship, and um, it worked out great. And you think, yes. and you think everyone would want to date on the show after? <laughs> well, that's the that thing. No, well, that I mean, really, fun, <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, sometimes it can get, you know. But you know, yeah, that's we're, what I want to know about. <laughs> See, that's why you're so good. Yeah, yeah. What happened backstage, like behind the scenes? We all just hung out together, and really? we really, like, I made some incredibly close friends who wow. I think I'll be that's close nice. with that's for really a really long cool. time. I was just yeah. imagining what your folks might say, your, or think. Your mom is here. She's actually in the building. She's <laughs> downstairs. What does she think of this turn of events? And were they all for you leaving college and taking this role? Yeah, both of my parents and, and really my whole family have, has just been so supportive yeah. throughout the entire thing. Yeah. And they know that I, I love it and that I'm passionate about you know acting and about the show. And so they were incredibly supportive. And By the way, this show, which I've never heard of this happening, got a second season pickup before it even aired. <laughs> How was that possible? I mean, I don't get it. You know, I'm Jenny like, Han's incredible, yeah. you know, writer, showrunner, uh, creator she's she's amazing and uh so you're in acting school and you're learning all the things that actors need to know and then you get tapped in the middle of acting school to actually go act you have to memorize the lines mm -hmm. and i don't know do you have a photographic memory how do you Ooh, no. how do you remember lines um i mean i think it's just a matter of, of running through them and we usually get new sides or i mean you know sides every morning and mm -hmm. uh you kind of work on those in the morning. Do you have a technique I mean, that you use? I feel like not really. Nothing's but oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I do like to juggle to help Here we me go. memorize. Okay, oh so tell goodness. me how that works in your brain. So you are juggling and I don't know if it's just like the repetition of it that mm. sort of helps so it. Show me how you, how do you do. Oh it? gosh, okay. That's okay. Oh, now I'm nervous. That, I know. No, there's no pressure. Okay, this is amazing. You're very, very good. You're very good. I, swear, I can't believe the lights. No, but you're yeah. Thinking, so you're thinking of the lines as you're doing yeah, it? Yeah, usually I'm kind of just in my trailer, just going over the lines, and I don't know, maybe it's just kind of... Do people kinda, watch you when you do it, or are you like Not private? usually. It's yeah, kind of just... private. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. so excited. By yeah. the way, this is such a fun moment in your career, and we feel so lucky that we got to have your oh, very yeah. first television so, interview. Thank you so much. Well, we're so proud of you. It's Congratulations. on it. Very likable. You know you watch or you like her. You can tell right here in this moment. The Summer I Turn Pretty is streaming right now on Prime Video. Be sure to join us Monday. We're going to kick off another big week. So much to discuss. Have a great weekend, y'all. Bye.
New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with lots. There's no other city that makes a bagel like a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wound eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And we got them all. Everything bagels, rainbow bagels, pumpkin bagels, croissant bagels, and of course you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty lox. I about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. Great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. This wow. is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank <laughs> like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Hattie, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because uh, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as, you know, cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water and when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. 
I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side and she once said that before she knew the word feminist, 
When she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're here in the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that, you know, people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> Okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content, from the milder Gaspe Nova to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get it that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> It takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So, Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. Yet. How, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices mm. are, don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. You make so, your faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should, you should look. I should you look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al. And you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right? So now that's Drastically, a very... Drastically. More than a, you think. That's more than... Oh my gosh, that's a very thick slice. We call slice. those chuletas. Chuletas? Yeah. Chops. Ah. Uh, in Spanish. I was going to say, that sounded that, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. Yeah. Does the way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Yeah, mm -hmm. the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into locks. It's a can't miss summer on today. Ah! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation? Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. The midterms are here. It's time to plan your vote. We'll provide everything you need to know to successfully cast your ballot. Just select any state you want to learn about for the primary or general election, and you'll instantly get voting rules, see the next big deadline, and learn how to take action for your plan. Voting rules have changed since 2020, and those rules vary from state to state. So it's time to get planning for 2022. Visit NBCNews.com slash plan your vote today. 
Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News now. Women's basketball has been systematically held back after 49 years of Title IX. We still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson now weekdays at five on NBC News now. I'm here at the Acme Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's taste, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step? cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. It's uh -huh. farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right. So what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bullet. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Yeah. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Underneath. And we're gonna lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll Give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally we would probably draw a uh, wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish, but for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. Okay. That's a huge fish. Right. 
After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the oven? You bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! Shut her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Women's basketball has been systematically held back. After 49 years of Title IX, we still have work to do. In Their Court, a podcast from NBC News and NBC Sports that goes inside the issues of inequality in women's sports. Listen now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! It's a can't-miss summer on today. Bam! They are walking strong, elegant, and pretty easy to prepare. How to cut costs on your vacation. Vicki has the answers. Every single thing you need for the best summer yet. Only on today. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. on the Lower East Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? They are. About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, was a tradition in our family, a dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. 
know, we're watching climate change happen right now, and I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food. So obviously a bagel and lox was gonna be there. Orchard Grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches, including Reuben's and tuna melts. But the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia. People are so worried about giving things up. So I think just creating those alternatives and just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty lox. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, and so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, I'm really fascinated. Okay, all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared, what do we have, maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge. These would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you <laughs> you have you have sliced them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm. Interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling yeah. it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great, so I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. Is another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot you. of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That exactly. does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Cheers. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Okay, a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food 
in New York City. Breaking news, assassinated former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe shot and killed at a campaign event. The shocking attack caught on tape. This morning, what we know about the motive and the investigation into how it happened in a country where gun violence is 